Well, I would say the concept behind the car phone and the phone machine, the speaker phone, the airline phone, the portable phone, the pay phone, the cordless phone, the multi-line phone, the phone pager, the call waiting, call forwarding, call conferencing, speed dialing, direct dialing, and the redialing is that we all have absolutely nothing to say, and we've got to talk to someone about it right now. <laughs> Cannot wait another second. I mean, come on, you're at home, you're on the phone, you're in the car, you're making calls, you get to work. Any messages for me? You gotta give people a chance to miss you a little. You're sort of famous for observational humor. And the field has been left somewhat open to you by the fact that nobody observes things anymore. They're all on cell phones. This, to me, is the greatest gift I've ever received. I can't believe everyone just gave it up. I mean, because I don't have a phone. Um, and I don't have any of these things. I, I'm, and I'm in the street a lot. I walk, I walk a lot, um, and I'm around the town a lot. And I, uh, it seems to me I'm the only person that's not looking down. And the, hence, when I talk to my friends, all of whom live in New York, about certain things, they never have noticed the thing. You know, I, I'll say, can you believe they took down that building on the corner? No. When did they do that? Didn't you notice that? No. But you live two blocks away. It doesn't matter. You know, also, if you're, you know, on the phone, if you're looking at the phone, that's where you are. So it's not just New York, it's geography in general that's been dispensed with, you know, because that means you're always in the place you want to be, you know, which is apparently, you know, dealing with yourself, you know. So, I mean, I look around me, you know, on the subway very often. Uh, I used to read over the shoulder of people who were reading newspapers, which used, people used to become furious at this. I always found that hilarious, as if your reading their newspaper was going to take the print away from them. <laughs> but I look so many people's phones, and I notice that the majority of people that I'm looking at their phones are playing games. I'm talking about adults. They're playing games. Uh, games. Adults. This cannot be good for the country. You know, I mean, they're playing games. Sometimes they're watching television shows. or. Uh, but I, I, I think, like, People go, what do you do on the subway? I can't read, and a moving thing, it makes me feel sick. Um, I'm watching my fellow human, and it, it's not encouraging. Well, I wanted to ask you about that Instagram scene in Brad's data, because it reflects Instagram perfectly, which is it, it takes you out of the present to look at someone else's curated life and feel bad about yourself, or feel like you're missing out on yeah. something. I mean, the truth is like, you know, it's, uh, I do think that that is something it's just like, it just feels like the world is so, you have so much information toward, you know, it used to be like, you had friends from high school and like, what happened to, you know, like, I wonder what happened to so-and-so and the answer is just never answered, yeah. you never know. Yeah. And like, and now it's just like ding, 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 ding. And it's like, and it's, it's, uh, it, it's almost impossible not to be able to, you know, it's like a harder to not know what happened. Right. And, and so I think the movie is about comparative anxiety and, you know, and most of the, the interactions he has is, uh, is through the phone, on the phone, through the thing, you know, it's like, and, and I think that that, that is so much of, I think, a big aspect to this general sense of uh, anxiety and envy and, and cravenness that a lot of us have because it's like, you know, it's like, I, you know, and I got off, I got off Instagram at one point because I was like, I was starting to, yeah, hate people that I generally, generally like when I see them in life. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh God, like something about what they were doing on thing like was just triggering me. But then I realized it was like, I'm probably doing the same thing to a lot of, you know, it's like, I have a, you know, it's like I go on vacations, I do things and like, I'm sure like, cause I'm posting this thing and like somebody's sitting in front of an edit bay or doing something or whatever, like, and they're like, yeah, great, fuck you. You know what I mean? It's like, and like you're oppressed, you know, there's little ways like you think you're just sharing, but in a way you're oppressing these people. With your you're not sharing that when you drop the sandwich face down. Right. That's and, not a moment you're yeah, sharing. Yeah, like as I'm sitting there like realizing, oh, the movie's a bomb or something, and I'm like, like yeah. hey, selfie. Ooh, like. Another bad <laughs> review. <laughs> bad review, link to bad review. <laughs> yeah, you don't do that. So like, uh, so, maybe and I don't know if that's, that's what people want to hear. You know, it's like, I don't know what I people I think they want do. To, yeah, maybe they do, but maybe, maybe, maybe just stop sharing. I don't know, maybe like just shut the, shut the, I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but it does feel like, um, you know, the hope of trying to just, uh, yeah, the things that are sustaining happinesses don't come from those things. On another level, it's just sort of the love of the cell phone gadget, you know? I think it's, 
it's a little bit, you know, it's funny to say, I, I often don't really want to talk about it because I feel like I'm the person who's never smoked telling some other people who smoke that's going to kill you, you know. I don't smoke anymore. But, um, what is it about the cell phone? I just think it's a, it's, it's a little bit funny, and I think you see it like in, if you see something like Black Mirror or something like that, or, or show something on TV where you see everyone looking at that on, on, on a, in a film, you can see how ridiculous it is. But for someone who, like me, who is one of the few who doesn't own a cell phone, it is pretty funny to walk down the street and see everyone doing this. You've never had a cell phone? I've never owned one, yeah. And um, so when I'm out there, I'm, I'm an anomaly, and I'm looking at everybody, and to me, everyone sort of looks silly, you know? And, then you're like, oh yeah, whatever, that's their lives, whatever. It's, or who knows, maybe this is the new, this is the way everything's gonna be from now on. I have no idea, no, nobody really does. Maybe we'll all have, it'll turn to implants, turn into a microchip behind our eyeball or whatever. Because you banned them from your gigs, haven't you? What, what effect yeah. has that had? I'm just sort of just, uh, I thought it was be an art project at first just to see if people would uh, think it was funny or cool or just a, a new experience, almost like a, uh, what do you call it, like an escape room or something like that, where, hey, wouldn't it be funny if we had this arena show and everyone who showed up, we were told them they couldn't use their phones. That would be like, maybe, I, we thought maybe even at first people would be mad enough to demand their money back and it might be something interesting would happen. To our, my surprise and everyone around us surprise, everyone loved it. It was, and it's, we've been doing it now for over a year, so it's been shocking how much people love it. And it's sort of like, it brings up these real big questions, like, so you need someone to tell you. You can't use it to actually not use it. How sad, that's pretty sad. Again, coming from someone who isn't part of it. To, uh, to, and it's easy for me to say, because I, I don't have that addiction, but it's, it's sad to say, uh, if you can't, you can't choose to just stop drinking for a day, it's, it's got that much of a hold on you. Uh, that's a sad thing, you know? So the same thing with that. If you, you, you can't just put that down for an hour and experience life in, in, real, in a real way, that's sad, and it's even maybe even sadder that you had to be told to do it. <laughs> you know? That you didn't naturally want to do it on your own. I mean, if I go and sit in the movie theater, if I even if I had a phone or anything, I would not want to even bring that out because I would want I want to be immersed. What, what is it like when you're on stage and all you can see is people holding up their phones filming you? It's kind of a. Uh, it's a little bit ridiculous for a lot of artists. It's hard to find an artist to say they like it. I, I have never really met an artist who says they like it. Whether publicly or privately, I, I've never met one who says they prefer it. I don't think anybody does. Even people who love attention, I don't think like it. Because everyone knows it's sort of kind of nonsense. It's sort of uh, a gr great example is, we, did, we had an example last year. We, had, I think we played through like a 10,000 seat arena and um, we were sitting backstage, me and the guy who's doing our photography. So he, we have a professional photographer and tour manager. So hey, you know what? The show got out 20 minutes ago, huh? Go look up on Twitter, t type in some words and look up on Twitter and see, see how many people are posting from the 10,000 people that came to the show tonight. They didn't have their phones during the show. At the end of the show, all their phones were unlocked and they're walking to their cars. So we've got 10,000 people who just had an experience. How many of them posted about it after it happened? Five people tweeted about it. If, that, if everyone had had their phones, maybe up, upwards of 10,000 people would have tweeted about that moment. And you realize what that means. That means a good portion of it, 90 plus percent, is look what I'm doing that you're not doing. See what I'm doing, what you're not doing? That's, that's why people are doing it. Uh, is this, this competition, voyeurism, jealousy? Those are really shallow human characteristics. Come on, man. I mean, that's not people like, I just watched the best film of my life. I just heard the most beautiful poem. Um, uh, it shows you that if it's not happening in the moment, then it's not, it's not worth it to them. So a lot of that is really nonsense. You know, it's sad too. <laughs> it's funny, man. My biggest fear is losing my family or people I love. And right up there, right alongside of it is losing my iPhone. You are on your phones a lot in this show. I was which like, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very true to life in media, and I'm sure it works fine for Apple product placement. But um, <laughs> speaking as, you know, the Hollywood Reporter also had its moment in the second episode. So it did. Um, yeah, there's a news clip that comes up with, from THR. But um, how do you act opposite a phone? Wait, are there like big scenes with the phone? I don't think so. You're in the hallway a lot on your phone. Yeah, that's up. life. Like, yes, yes, just, everybody on their phone. Probably more Alex than Bradley. Oh my lord. Uh, <laughs> I just draw from experience. <laughs> <laughs> you know? 
You have to know these media people are on their yes. phone constantly. Constant. I mean, constant. Twitter I, constantly. It's 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 crazy to watch. Because you can't be a beat behind. You can't be a minute behind. And if you're a day late, you've lost the story. Mm -hmm. So much competitive scoop, like people scooping you is a huge deal. Because you're talking oh, yeah. about a $500 million enterprise. And mm -hmm. if you drop in the ratings to second, you lose about $100 million in advertising. Everything's changing. This has changed a lot. This is my favorite thing in the world. My woman hates this. My phone, you always on that damn phone. It's everything for me. I pay my bills here, it's my flashlight, it's my photo album, it's my camera, right? It's actually everything but a phone for me. How many get mad when somebody call you on the fucking phone? It's a new day. Right, you're like, Text me, motherfucker. Who? <laughs> that old motherfucker is calling me and leaving a voicemail. Look at him leaving. A... Oh, that's grandma. She's saying, "Don't come back. Don't come back." <laughs> <laughs> she sent the Ben Wall balls emoji. <laughs> grandma, crazy. <laughs> this is important. I got a new case. I get a new case every couple months. My girl says I take my phone clothes shopping. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I take her too. You know, I go to the Apple store and get a new case and I let her go next door to Forever 41. <laughs> you can tell how important something is by how you react when you lose it. You ever misplaced your phone? I misplaced my phone earlier today and got heart palpitations. <laughs> You're not supposed to get heart palpitations over misplacing your phone. I left my son in the mall when he was little and didn't get heart palpitations. <laughs> That's too important. It makes you crazy. I've actually been looking for mine and realized I was on the motherfucker. <laughs> He said, wait, hold on for a minute. I did that today. That San Jose weed is a motherfucker. That, oh, oh, it's crazy up here. It's crazy. Was, Where's my phone? And in LA, if I'm on a bike, I would say I regularly look to my right and I look to my left and both people on either side of me are texting. Do you ever see, I mean. Yes, all the time. All the time. When I'm in my truck, especially, because I can look down. Yeah, and you yeah. realize you realize that in this town, 60% of people at any given moment are texting on their phone. And it's just appalling. And it's so dangerous. Yeah. And I'll be on, if I'm on a motorcycle in LA, I'll look at people, they're texting for so long, and finally I'll have to like hit the horn or something and look at them. I've gotten past like, you know, anger and literally just looked at people flip my thing up and gone like please like please get off your phone like you're going to kill somebody and kill yourself but but we can't we can't break the addiction people cannot break the addiction um and and i i it's not a more you you realize it isn't a character flaw it's not it's not like what an asshole it's everybody it's your mom it's your sister mm. it's your friend Everybody is doing it because we're addicted, like yeah. a device addicted. But, but when you're on a bike and you realize, like, I am floating in a sea of people who are going to mess up. Someone is going to mess up. When I stop drinking alcohol, I just don't be an alcoholic. I just, I actually, I go more alcoholic in an odd way. Mm -hmm. um, but so I've had addiction. I haven't had an addiction to porn because I'm a Scottish Protestant and it's just <laughs> way too uncomfortable but, but I've had the video game things and then fucking uh, Candy Crush or but here's the thing about about video games that in my experience not necessarily everybody else's I've never played so many video games that I've blacked out and hit a cop 
I've never played so many video games that I've broken the hearts of people who have, were misfortunate enough to love me. You know, I've annoyed myself and other mm. people, but the, but the scale of the what the damage of these things has for me. Now, I'm not saying that that's not possible, but mm. for me, that has not happened. Yeah, um, and I seem to be able to put things down easier, um, with the exception of what, I, about a year ago, I stopped going on social media. Uh, about three or four months ago, I stopped going on the internet at all. Wow. And I experienced withdrawal from that in a way that I haven't since nicotine, really, which is about wow. 20 years ago. And that I think a lot of people have and are unaware of. What are you, wh how did you feel? Like, what was the feeling? Restless, was it a similar... irritable, discontent, uh, insomnia, uh, wild mood swings, depression, all of the friends that turn up yeah. when, when you try to break an addictive cycle. Um, I have a lot of addiction in my family as well. And when you're struggling with, you know, people that you love that are suffering addiction, learning about neurology and how addiction works is the only thing that will stop your heart from getting broken every day. So I had this kind of crash course in how to hack your brain. So for me, I worked so hard to stay away from dramatic situations to lower my adrenaline in cortisol levels. I try to stay off Instagram. I try to stay off gossip sites. I, try I was to gonna say like Instagram kind of, I mean, it'll constant spiral adrenaline. you yep. into self-doubt, self-worth. Who is this person dating yep. now? Do you I have, have someone that handles your social for I you? I do. Good for I you. I have someone, I outsource it to somebody else as a form of self-care. Um, I put my phone in uh, grayscale, which makes it black and white because yeah. a lot of what's so addictive about it is the color. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about Instagram. Yeah, Frances Hogan. Mm -hmm. So we said she leaked a bunch of internal Facebook documents to the Wall Street Journal, and yeah, there was a big kerfluffle about this. It was all over the news. And basically, everyone's suspicions about these platforms, ourselves included, were confirmed. 100%. This shit is bad for you. Yeah, And yeah. they know it. Yeah, and, and that's like, I mean, that, I'm sure that's not, you know, coming as a surprise to anybody. Any, if you think about social media for two seconds, mm. you're like, yeah, this is not good for you yeah but it's it's it is interesting that they have sort of in a way quantified some of this stuff and the statistics here are like you know we, we can link to the actual documents they show facebook in fact actually put them up with annotation i know the annotations are very funny mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's it's like a little yeah. like debunker yeah exactly but then it's, you know it's not really debunking it. But there was some pretty surprising stuff like teenagers are basically Instagram relies on teenagers now spending three to four hours a day on the app, which I got to say long time to be on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, and they were worried. They are worried about other apps eating into that time. TikTok in particular, sure. which is very popular among young people and Snapchat, which never used. Well, that three to four hours a day is actually like basically double or triple what it was before the pandemic. Mm. And Instagram now is very anxious to hold on to that time increase. And you know, they're very set on this teen market. And it turns out they know their product is really bad for teenagers. Yeah, it's led to like a huge increase in what, I mean, this is from their own documents and suicidal thoughts among teenagers. I, I think like this is all stuff that we've like suspected, particularly with young girls. Mm -hmm. And you saw like with the explosion of, you know, kind of like Tumblr communities and the early internet, like early 2.0 internet yeah. or whatever, like the, um, you know, you see kind of like an increase in eating disorders and that stuff kind of like, um, like, I don't know, even like memefied into like kind of spreading around certain, mm -hmm. certain groups. But it seems like Instagram is really like making this worse, worse for young girls. Yeah, I mean, one of their own slides in this little slideshow that they made says, we make body image issues worse for one in three teen girls. Yeah. By the way, I think this stuff also is applicable to adults, absolutely too. I think what's important then to understand is, or like really examine is, what is the innovation with Instagram that makes it kind of technologically, like from a production standpoint, so much different, right? What mm. is it about Instagram that is making, you know, making, bo like, t in, you know, to quote them, body images worse for teen girls than other platforms? Yeah. And I think that's, like, really worth examining. We've talked about that on this show, like, my own feelings about why I think Instagram is, like, one of the most dangerous, although that was kind of before it seems TikTok took off, which we'll talk about in a second. But um, there is something, again, about the, the the mechanism of an image being shown back to you and kind of living in a world that you've curated. Like, but it's not just other girls. They're looking at them themselves. Yeah. Right? 
there's a mechanism there at work that I think, you know, we, we can get into some of the kind of like aspects of social media with this, but it's, you know, you're putting yourself into a machine and it's showing back a kind of perverted version of yourself yes. to you, whether it's what you want to see about see of the world or whether it's like literally an image of yourself, like a selfie or whatever. And it's, um, it's uncanny. Like there's something wrong. It, it, it's going to distort your total perception of yourself and others and the world. And, and, and that is, yeah, it'll it'll have some really detrimental effects. Yeah, absolutely. And like it's I think too like even the action of putting your own image, you know, even if you filter it or whatever on this same and like seeing it in sort of the same format that you see the images of like a, a supermodel or whatever, or not even a supermodel but like an influencer. Mm-hmm. Like and you're like, "Well, I'm fucking ugly." There's yeah. like studies that show like 40% of Instagram users, or excuse me, this was actually was a Facebook study. 40% of Instagram users who reported feeling unattractive said that that feeling started when they were using Instagram. Like they could trace it back there, Yeah, which is insane. And it's not just like your own personal like attractiveness in terms of like how you look. I mean, that's a huge part of it for sure. But also depending on what you're looking at on Facebook, it's how you see your life in relation to other, like all aspects of your life. Yeah. You know, if that has to do with your kids or that has to do with your home or that has to do with your outfits or that has to do with, uh, your vacations or your ability to have any of those things, you know, that can completely, um, distort your own sort of like, the way that you view your own life. In yeah. Those yeah. hundred percent. And it's, it's, I don't know. It's, it's, it's funny because a lot of the sort of like discourse around this, even from lawmakers, from like, you know, op-ed writers from any of this involves some sort of like fail safes or like new features that Instagram or these, these platforms yeah, can bullshit. add that'll mitigate this total bullshit. Yeah. I mean, it, like we're trying to say, it's the mech, it's the, it's the actual like mechanics of the social production that occurs on these platforms that exactly. fuels this. It's not, there's no tricks that you can like, yeah. there's no safeguards. What these platforms do in their own respects, but they do, and on, whether on Twitter or Instagram or TikTok or whatever, is what you're watching in real time and, and what is making you feel crazy is you're watching the circuit of capital happen at a really fucking quick speed. You're watching yes. yourself commodified in real time. Yeah. And it's fucking sickening. Yeah. But it's, it's what makes you feel crazy. It's, it's, yeah, a- a- absolutely there. A hundred percent. And like the fact that so much of this is now, I mean, Instagram had a huge marketing budget specifically towards like young teenagers. I mean, that is like, no, cause they know, they know, they fucking know. And they know that these people are obviously like, I mean, you and I and young Chomsky all grew up in an era before of this, probably the last, Sort of generation. Yeah, we were just talking about that last night. I feel very hashtag blessed Uh to, um, for what little time I had to experience. I don't know what it would be like as a kid being like, what, whatever, digitally native or this stuff just being Mm -hmm. kind of the like, like we said, like there, it's not an appendage. It is fully integrated in our lives. This idea that it's somehow outside or separate or something is completely wrong. Like, this is just how you interact with the world now. And I, I don't know how I feel about that. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't know exactly how I feel about that. I, I'll tell you, I know exactly how I feel mm. about that. I think every single social media platform should be annihilated and their, mm. their, their owners and many of the people who work at them should be arrested, imprisoned, or executed. Absolutely. These people are fucking poison salesmen. And it's and they're it's not even poison salesman because you can go around your life you don't have to fucking have poison anytime this shit you gotta have this shit in order to do like half of the stuff that most people do day to day I mean again and and to see even like all these sort of people talking about like oh privacy or free speech right it's like brother you are arguing with the warden about the fucking about the the terms of the prison baby like yeah. I mean it is these things should be they are they are sick and they are bad like you can't make them good in any way. What's crazy is like, this is fucking huge. And if you're normal, you probably don't even really know it exists, Mm. right? 
Like it's like I, you would might we might never encounter this outside of like a straight article or something. But let me tell you, your kids are. Yeah. Um. And and what, what's so crazy about this is too is is that I I got to thinking with the TikTok ticks is that like. I watch a lot of these videos and these people, you know, sort of have these like arm motions or, you know, like jerking around and stuff. And it mimics so much to me the dances that they do on TikTok, which are yeah, absolutely like made for portrait mode. Right, like right, Like these right. sort of small movements. All these movements are sort of designed for, confined to, produced by the screen that they're meant to be shown on. Exactly. And yeah. so there's a bit of a dialectical movement precisely baby doll precisely it's dialectical Tourette's yeah. and these people are like getting these symptoms and functional symptoms means it's like you know like they have these symptoms they are right, right, real right. symptoms but like at that point it's like are you thinking well you got to think like well if these people functionally have Tourette's they got Tourette's from fucking TikTok at the beginning like in the abstract of this paper there the 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 researchers wrote Functional Tourette-like symptoms can be regarded as the modern form of the well-known motor variant of MSI. How, moreover, they can be viewed as the 21st century expression of a culture-bound stress reaction of our postmodern society, emphasizing the uniqueness of individuals mm. and valuing their alleged exceptionality, thus promoting attention-seeking behavior and aggravating the permanent identity crisis of modern man. I said, I've got some cash, so I pull out some cash. He takes it from me. And then uh, I had, like, my headphone... Jack is just sticking into my pocket and he was like, what's that plugged into? I'm like, oh, God's sake, it's my phone. Right. So he's like, pull out your phone. So I pull out my phone and I'm thinking, okay, this is really annoying, but, you know, I'll wipe it and get a new phone and kind of whatever. Not worth fighting over a phone. Not worth fighting over. And then uh, the guy's like, okay, unlock your phone. And uh, the other one like pulls his shirt up and he's got like a knife sticking in his in his pants. I was like, shit. And I'm kind of thinking, like, do I? I just said, like, I can't. Like, I'm sorry. I, like, well, mate. I was like, mate, I, I can't. I'm not my phone. And then the guy's like, you've got ten seconds to unlock your phone. He starts counting down. And I'm like, fuck. Am I gonna unlock my phone? Am I gonna give him my phone? What's the deal? So then I try and give him my phone, and he's like, no, I need to unlock it. And I was like, I can't. And then. There's a little pond behind them near where I live, and I, I thought about throwing it in the pond to just be like, but no, they would, neither of us have it, right? Yeah, but then they would have stabbed you. And uh, and then I thought I didn't want to piss them off. Right. And the lights changed, and there was like two cars coming, and I just like felt an opportunity, and I just sprinted, ran. And they didn't chase you? Well, I ran into the road, and I tried to stop a car. And obviously, a madman runs into the road, tries to get in your car. You're not going to let him in. So right. they don't let me in. Uh, try and get in another car. Don't let me in. But now I'm slightly away from them because I'm in the street. And I think, like, I just burned, just turned down and ran back towards, like, the little village area near where I live. So I just kind of sprinted. But usually when I'm out walking, I'm wearing, like, running stuff. Right. And this was the one night I'm wearing like corduroy flares and shoes. Yeah, great. And I was like, I'm going to have to fucking sprint all the way down this hill. So, uh, yeah, I just sprinted down down the thing. And, and I guess because they had some cash and stuff, they just ended up turning around. I'm struggling with the fact that I have two girls in middle school right now. So your film scared the crap out of me. And I just wonder if there's something positive that that uh, that you found about this particular era we're in with social media, with how fast kids seem to be growing up. And the true terror would be not acknowledging it and not seeing it. That would be the actual most dangerous thing that could happen. I do think there's, I think the internet is not bad or not even a majority bad at all. Well, I think that what happens for a parent is we wonder how to protect our kids. Right, and, and right. And they can't make it, I, I worry that kids can't sort out all the information that they have access to. Right, can we, though? And, and I mean, we can't mean, either, that, but at least yeah. we have, we've sort of at run least we the, have the new. At least we have the nukes and everything. And that's, I mean, I don't know, I, I don't, I, there's no real at least to me, uh, for me, like, um, and I wasn't interested in particular in 13 year olds because I was interested in the problems facing kids. You know, I felt like, the kids for me were expressing the problems we're all facing just more viscerally than, than we were. But like, we as adults, we need to clean up our own sort of 
information processing before we start to you know wag our fingers at what kids are doing about the internet and internet culture and these kids addicted to their phone. I'm like, what are we addicted to? How do we exchange information? Um, we've completely set the culture on fire, I think, through um, the exact thing we're worried that kids might one day do. What are we worried? That these kids are gonna be raised on their phones, have no way to communicate with each other, and then eventually, I don't know, elect a psycho to be, I mean, what are we talking about? We're there, you, right. know, you know, like. Well, I think um, the difference is that I can use social media without the number of likes directly affecting my self-esteem. Mm. And I have the experience to separate the two, but I do wonder like what you found about that audience that gets created or that desire for, you know, your online life gets presented as something that you then have to live up to. Yeah, And the yeah. pressure of that. You, you may have that lived-in experience that allows you to disassociate from whatever those, like, toxic effects of the internet are. I don't. So I feel, like, right in the mix with them. And what I hope the movie sort of does, and what I think I hope all of my work was trying to sort of get at, which is to try to give a more subjective, emotional, description of what the internet is. Not like a description of the internet as most people do, which is like the rates of cyberbullying are up and kids are spending five hours staring at a screen and they're getting headaches. And it's like, no, 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 what is the feeling of, and you hinted at this, walking through your life and not just living your life, which is already hell and impossible, but taking inventory of your life, being a viewer to your own life, living an experience and at the same time hovering behind yourself and watching yourself live that experience, being nostalgic for moments that haven't happened yet, planning your future to look back on it. Those are really weird, strange, disassociative things that are, that are I think, new because of the specific structure of social media and the way it sort of disassociates ourself from ourself. I don't know, it's, and it's really hard to process it. You know why? Because if you take long enough to think about it, these, these really complex social media, whatever setups that we have, take a long time to process. And by the time you process it and take the time, it is obsolete and it's on to the next thing. I feel like people aren't embarrassed enough these days. I mean, That's people terrible. taking selfies in the street, I drive by and I go, be embarrassed. Yeah. It's 100% agree. It's humiliating. I like the fact that I am mysterious. I don't have a computer. I'm not interested in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I, I don't like that world, so I'm not going to live in it. Well, interestingly, after that big final network test, um, back before we had cell phones and all that stuff, I walked out of there and I thought, this is going to be a big deal if I get it or I don't. It's kind of like a big deal. so. I remember I drove a pickup truck back then, and I drove my pickup truck, I did, and I drove it to this, what to me was kind of like a fancy restaurant, and I had this big steak dinner by myself, and then I went home, and there were all these messages on my answering machine saying, where are you? Like, you got the job. But I, I, I look back now, and I think, That's, that was such a funny thing to do. Like, in some way, I knew, like, that things were going to be different after this, and I just wanted to take this moment on my own. And I love that. I love that I like had this big steak dinner. By yourself. By myself. Like, I, I just see you as yeah. this person out in LA, you're by yourself. Yeah. My pickup truck. And, 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 just... and you're just about to either get yeah. the biggest news of your life, either positive yeah. or negative, and, and you like, don't is... like call your friends, or you're just yeah. by yourself. I'm like, I'm going to go, I'm going to have a dinner, and then I'm going to find out what happens. It's amazing. <laughs> and. Think about that pre-cell phone world where right. it was you're so at a much state better. dinner, nobody can find you. Nobody can find me. You, you so get a better. chance to live that moment. Yeah, for a yeah. Do you think you were almost holding off the, uh, the moment? I think that's probably what it was. I think I was like, before I feel it, I just like, I'm gonna go have dinner and I'm gonna have a moment to myself. And then, yeah. You're doing a, if I have it correct, no cell phone mm -hmm. kind of thing. Something yeah. about park your cell phone in a plastic bag or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Tell this me about is, that. Uh, this is while uh, Chris Rock again. He had done this uh, comedy show at Third Man, and he had he, he was testing that out. That sounds the like it was quite a day between you it and was. Chris Rock. There it was a, a lot of things was. that came out of that. It was. <laughs> we found a lot of common ground, and uh, but what? But, but I'll, I'll tell you why. Because when I don't have, because I, I don't have a set list, I really react to the crowd just like a stand-up comedian would. If a stand-up comedian goes on stage and they tell a couple of jokes and they hear crickets. They know, okay, those Donald Trump jokes aren't working for this crowd. I got to go switch over to this kind of material. And they go and start talking about this. 
and that's working. Okay, now I got him on a roll, and I'm going to keep going. That's how I work with no set list. If I finish a song and it's ta-da and it's crickets, I'm like, well, I don't know what to do now. Am I supposed to play a heavier song, a faster song? Do you want me to play acoustic? Do you want me to leave? You guys want me to leave? I'll leave. I mean, you know. Uh, but what, what I don't like is, is that how they really feel or are they just not even paying attention because they're not engaged because well, they're doing course, this? Yeah. Of they're texting. And so when he, I saw him do that, he was trying to protect, uh, uh, he was just, I want to test out jokes and I don't want them to get on YouTube because I don't know if they're going to be any good yet. So I'm playing these small clubs, locking your phones in a bag and they hand you the bag. You carry the bag with you, this little pouch. And it has the phone. Well, you just can't access it. If you want to access it, you just step out of the hall, step out of the room, and unlock it, and you can use it. So um, I thought, that's brilliant. This is going to be the first like a major, I think, music tour to, to, to use this. But what we were doing before was Lala would go out and ask the crowd, can you please not raise your phones that. up? Yeah, I remember that. And the yeah. crowd would cheer and say, yeah, we're on the side of that. We love that I idea. And then they were still doing but what they were doing, it, 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 But the, what they were doing was they, instead of holding it up, they were just going down here and texting and, and whatever, doing all that. It's still not engaged because when you go to a movie theater, a symphony, church, whatever, there are all these moments in life where people put those away and, and engage. And um, I love the idea of rock concerts being punk as hell and there's no rules. I love that. But I don't like the idea that I have no idea what to say, play next. And I need, I need that. Or Because I've walked off stage like, man, I'm really... I really don't know what to do anymore. If this is going to be how, how it's going to be from now on, it's going to be sure. very difficult for me to play. I might have to start having set lists and really figuring out how to connect with him. Because another thing is I don't have those gigantic FM radio hits where I can like hit them with that and there's you know a festival of 100,000 people singing along. I got one or two things like that, but I don't have like, you know, you, if you're the Chili Peppers or Green Day, you can go and hit them with 15 songs of the 100,000 people know every word. And obviously you guys too. I don't have that, so I'm working in a little bit of a different scenario. It's hard to believe that anybody who appreciates you, respects you, and is a fan of yours would not 100% support this position. I mean, it's mm. it's weird that if there would be any, I don't know what the. It's uh, been it's been it's been sort of like skeptical, but I think really positive so far. And we did it a couple. We did it in Third Man Entertainment. People people loved it at Third Man in a small venue. It is really cool that if you want to go see Chris Rock, that you can't just go on YouTube and see all the material. Mm -hmm. you know before you go or whatever so there is still yeah, an element still something of new, yeah. something that you don't know what's going to happen i mean imagine yeah. that because when you were a kid if you saw deep purple came to town you had no idea what set they played no, last night no, of course not. and you had no idea what they were going to do tomorrow well you you were just there in that moment and that was beautiful and you took away that with you when you left you're trying to get people back into just enjoying them in the music mm. Uh, I've had the experience when I go out and perform in front of people where all I see is a sea of iPads. People yeah, yeah. put, and you can't even see their faces, they're just holding iPads up and yeah. you just see screens because they're recording it for later. You're asking people, look, I'll make all the video, you're telling people, I'll make all the video available to you, but I want you yeah. to not shoot it while we're doing the show. We tried that the last tour uh, when we started. I, I, I asked if we could do that, go out and talk to the crowd and say, would you please just not take your phones out? Let's just enjoy this with our eyes and ears. And, and, and people said, people are going to get upset and people are going to And we tried it and people loved it. People applauded when we asked them for that. It's like they applauded and all, everyone as a, as a mob agreed. You know, we, we don't like this idea, this practice. Because I think it's distracting for the people in the back who are trying to really watch. And you see a sea of blue screens in front of them, between yeah. them and the artist. You know, someone told me it was in France or something. I think they were talking about Iggy Pop or something. Did an amazing jump into the crowd and some amazing moment happened with him. And then everybody who was there all pulled out their phones and were filming the moment. But nobody was f in the moment. Everyone was documenting the moment. Also, more importantly, they couldn't catch him. <laughs> They're going with their phones. But uh, yeah, yeah, it'd be better to be in the moment, you know, I think. And people are really loving that. We're doing that again on this tour. And other acts, too, started doing that. I think Kanye started doing that, too. And I think it's just, it's just better that way. You know? Yes. Yeah. Now, you've been in the live music game for a very long time. Uh, the Strokes are notoriously an amazing live act, and, and you are yourself. Do you still enjoy it, and how much has it changed in that time? Because we've got some footage here, actually. This is you playing a show earlier this month, and uh, you're out there rocking amongst everybody, but you're just lost in a sea of phones. <laughs> and I noticed this over the weekend in Splendor. All the kiddies just experience live music through the screens now. Is that They're annoying? that close to me, yet they... It's like they need to capture it. It's like, wait a second, I'm so close. <laughs> I must remember this. Uh, yeah, I mean, I try not not to judge. I always feel a little weird when I, I enjoy like when they dance with me or jump up and down. Sometimes they like patting me on the head, which I feel like is a strange thing <laughs> in the crowd. And everyone's like, 
good shot. Good album. Good shot. <laughs> you know, I'm just. Uh, so if you if you're there and you're in the crowd with me, let's just dance and have fun. You know, be in the moment. Be present. Do you, you ever know? film stuff when you go see shows as well on your phone? No. No. Okay. No, I don't. You get some goddamn respect. No. No, it's not that. I just didn't really, I didn't really grow up with that. So it just seems like a weird thing to pull to pull out. For you younger people, a Palm Pilot was <laughs> one of the first pieces of handheld technology with a screen on it, an interactive screen it had. Like, pretend like I'm showing you. <laughs> and there was no Wi-Fi or cell phone, but, and you could write on the screen with a stylus, like a little pen. And I believe, if I'm not remembering incorrectly, that you, you had to write in Palm Pilot shorthand, which was enough for me to stop using it after three days. <laughs> oh, I gotta learn a thing, not for me. So, <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, it was one of the first pieces of handheld technology, sort of a futile thing. It had this weird feature where it could communicate with other Palm Pilots, but we never knew why. And you always felt kind of stupid doing it, but you would have to do it if you knew somebody with a Palm Pilot. But the Palm Pilots went away. They became extinct. And it was just part of the evolution to the technological clusterfuck that we find ourselves in the center of now, just happily codependent to a bunch of smarter machines, just gleefully enabling the singularity, just looking forward to a day where we'll just be the fleshy appendage of a series of smarter equipment than us. Oh, how convenient that'll be. Too dark? I can go another way. I think if most of us, if we lost our cell phone, you're like two hours away from wandering the street saying, what's my name? Where do I live? I have a family, but I don't know how to get in touch with them or where they are anymore. Are you okay, old man? Do you need to go to the hospital? No, son, I've lost my phone. Do you like me to call it for you, old man? Yes, please, thank you, son. What's the number, old man? I don't know, I don't call myself. It's in the phone. Oh, no. Yeah, take me to the hospital. <laughs> there was a time, folks before cell phones and the internet. Yeah, some of you remember. I saw, I saw the audience. Back then, people had to do things like wait. Yeah, you had to wait for stuff. And if you were actually waiting, like in line or something, that was all you could do. Feel all that space I created? That used to be around us all the time. There was all this space that wasn't, oh, mental space. I mean, you had to wait to check for your messages at the end of an entire day. Like, if you couldn't get calls at work, there was no way anyone could get in touch with you. And at the end of the day, sometimes six or seven at night, you would go home, look at a machine on your kitchen counter to see if a light was blinking. And if it was, you'd actually feel a tangible jolt of excitement. Oh, so message, someone called. And then you'd push a button, and like eight out of 10 times, it would be na 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 Some of you don't even know what that sound is. Does that sound even exist in nature anymore? That was a sound on your machine if someone had hung up. Right, and if it went on long enough, you'd hear a voice go, if you'd like to make a call, please hang up and try. What happened to that guy? I don't know. Can't be a good story. And then if you got some of those, you'd spend like 10 minutes just wondering like, who called me and hung up? That was the kind of mental time we had back then. Like, what were we doing with all that mental space, using our imagination, just letting our memories do what they do in their own time and pace? Like, back then, if you couldn't remember something, that was sort of the end of it. <laughs> Unless, like, you couldn't remember something and you locked on, that was problematic, because what could you do then? Yeah, not easy. <laughs> like, let's say you just, Driving to work, this is back in the day. Let's go there now.
just driving to work, maybe listening to a cassette in your in-dash player through some uh, Jensen coaxials or triaxial speakers. If you had a lot to prove, you had a power amp bolted onto the floor. Maybe you're listening to a little Leonard Skinner second helping. Not a bad band. Stop judging that band. Solid rock band. A lot of good records. Amazing double live album. You're misunderstanding that one song. Re listen to it again. Listen to it again. Maybe you're listening to Lil Skinner at Second Helping. You know exactly where the tape is fucked up from that day it got stuck in the machine. That was a tough few minutes. Oh, shit, come on, man. Come on. Oh, yeah. Get it out, get the pen out, roll that cassette back up, pop it back in the deck. Now you know, call me the breeze, baby. Oh, that was that day. That was a terrible morning. You're just driving to work, enjoying the music. No cell phone to distract you. No internet. Maybe you're just eating, on, eating some trail mix. So anyways, you're driving to work. Back in the day, maybe you're chewing on a peanut. And all of a sudden, your brain just goes, oh, fuck. Who is peanut guy? We learned about him in elementary school. Peanut guy, peanut butter, peanut oil. Fucking peanut guy. It's like three names. It's an inventor, a scientist. God damn it! Why can't I remember Peanut Guy? And that was sort of your day. <laughs> like, you did other things. Like, you go to work, but every couple hours, you're like, fucking Peanut Guy! And there was nothing you could do. I mean, you could ask a coworker, dude, dude, we, do you remember Peanut Guy? We learned about him in elementary school. Peanut butter, peanut oil, inventor, scientist, three names. I can't fucking remember it. You gotta calm down. Why are you yelling? Do, do you know or not? I don't have to talk to you if you're gonna talk to me like that. Well, why don't you go fuck yourself? Why don't you just say you don't know and fucking piss off? Then you go to lunch from work, take a lunch break, go eat a sandwich. It's all you could do. Eat the sandwich. Watch other people eating sandwiches. <laughs> Just reflect on the sad tedium of self-awareness. <laughs> Go back to work. <laughs> Fucking peanut guy! <laughs> Maybe call a friend from work. You're not even supposed to use the phone. Dude, are you there? Pick up. It's me. Are you there? Pick up. Fuck! Where the fuck are you, man? It's me. Do, we, do you remember peanut guy? <laughs> we learned about him in elementary school. Peanut guy, peanut butter, peanut oil. Three names, a scientist, or inventor or some shit. Fuck, I can't fucking remember Peanut Guy. I'm not even supposed to be using the phone. Where the fuck are you? Who the fuck was Peanut Guy? It's Mark, I'm okay. Um, call, call me back when he gets it. Well, call me back later, I gotta go. Then you leave work, drive home, listen to the cassette. Sweet home Alabama. <laughs> Happened twice. Probably should get a new tape, new deck, something. You get home. Oh, messages. The machine's beeping. I hope it's not a hang-up. Beep! George Washington Carver, man. It's George Washington Carver. Dude, are you okay? I got your message, and you sounded so freaked out. You sounded crazy. And I didn't have anything to do today, so I'm at the library right now. <laughs> If you need me to look up some other stuff, I mean, you just sounded really crazy, man. Are you there? Are you okay? All right, call me back. George Washington Carver, very interesting. I'm still reading about him. I know a lot of shit now. Hope you're okay, buddy. Bye-bye. And, and that's sort of how you did a search back then. It was uh, a longer process. My favorite thing is the uh, magic phones that we all have. You know, <clears throat> not so long ago, phones were not magic. They were just used to telephone people. And uh, they couldn't take pictures, you know? If you wanted to take a picture, this was only like 20 years ago, you would have to use it. You couldn't use a phone. I remember I'd try, go, okay, just hold on there. Just... <laughs> people go, what are you doing? I go, don't worry. It's... I was kind of ahead of my time, but they thought...
No, you had to use a camera, and then you would put film in the camera, and then you would go to a photo mat. It was wonderful, and you'd give it to this old man, and he'd go behind some beads and stuff, you know? <laughs> And then you go, when am I going to see them pictures? And you go, I don't know. And then you go, I'll phone you every couple of weeks. How'd that be? And then one day you got the news. Your pictures were ready. And so you brought your whole family, and you all showed up. And you got that envelope. It was wonderful. And you, you opened that seal, you know? And then there were the pictures, a whole handful. Like you go, hey, look at this. It's a picture of Aunt Ida, but her eyes are red like the devil. <laughs> Maybe Aunt Ida's the devil. <laughs> hey, look at this. It's a picture of my dog, but I put a hat and glasses on it so it looked like a person. <laughs> Still looks kind of like a dog a little bit. <laughs> hey, look, it's a picture of you. But look at your jacket and your hair. Ah! <laughs> look at the way you used to ah! Remember that hair? <laughs> so you needed that time for the picture to have make any sense or have any resonance. You know, nowadays you go, hey, would you like to see a picture of you standing right where you are one second ago? <laughs> I got one here. Your hair is identical. <laughs> Guess it would be, huh? In the real old days, they would take pictures like, and at my house I have a picture of my great-grandfather. And I only have one, you know? Back then, they only had one picture of everybody <laughs> because they'd pull that thing and it would explode and all that shit, you know? <laughs> and uh, it was just my, nobody was happy because it took so long to get your picture taken. And so it's just my great-grandfather going, hi. <laughs> How long is this going to take, Sarah? <laughs> Who's going to feed them hogs? <laughs> Damn sure ain't going to be Marjorie, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but it comes at a good time, this, uh, where we're all quarantined, because we know how to live like that, right? We got our fucking magic phones and computers and everything. We don't need no fucking people. I don't know how people feel anymore. Do you have that inside of you? Like, we have all this ability as human beings to communicate with nuance, and there's expression, and there's subtlety, and there's back and forth, and we just send out a smiley face and go, I hope that covers it, you know? <laughs> there's a lot going on in here, but salsa dancing girl. Uh, <laughs> I think I made my point. Are you ready? <laughs> no, I thought we were going bowling and I feel a little underdressed for flamenco dancing. <laughs> These little things, they pack way too much weight, you know, a period in the wrong place, it can just ruin my day, really. You wanna go to dinner? No, period. <laughs> oh, I get it, I get it. We're not going to dinner, but can I say your period is unnecessary and hurting my feelings. I don't need it in my life. There's enough finality in no, I don't need it, you know? <laughs> We've ruined exclamation points. People send four, six. Where are we going? <laughs> Just send one, it's not a scale, you know? But if I send one, I feel like the other end is going, is this sarcasm or uh, what is this? <laughs> this is how we meet people. People always tell me, you should meet somebody on the internet. But they do it with this attitude like, I would never. But I think that's a good idea for you. <laughs> do you know people like that? There are people in here right now on like their second or third internet date just both looking straight ahead going, Pl please drop this topic. <laughs> like they don't even want to admit it to each other. But that's just how people meet and it's okay. I know these solid couples who meet on the internet. You ask them, how did you meet? This is what happens. The women go, we met on the internet. And then the men go, please stop telling people that. Now I think, <laughs> I think it's because the attitude is a little different. When a woman gets on the internet to find someone, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the attitude is, I'm just exploring my options. When a man gets on the internet to meet someone, do you know what the attitude is? I have depleted all my options. <laughs> there is nowhere else to go. Let's search the universe, because that's all that's left. It's just a Hail Mary pass into the ether. Is anybody open? Anybody. Somebody catch that, please. 
I'm not dating anymore. I'm data mining. I'm just swimming through ones and zeros. <laughs> just... <laughs> All my friends now are on these uh, location-based dating apps. Do you know what I'm talking about? When I say all my friends are on these location-based dating apps, what I mean is I'm on all these location-based <laughs> dating apps. <laughs> we have all these devices constantly broadcasting our location, right? So here's what dating has become in the modern world. Who's right here, right now? It's like we're hunting fugitives on the run or something, you know? <laughs> Set a 10-mile perimeter, close all the roads. <laughs> She's got a five-mile head start. Move it, move it! It's like, who are you interested in? Everyone in a 100-yard radius, basically, I'm just... <laughs> I'm not really into long-distance relationships. <laughs> but what's your type? Just people near me, uh, just in that general area. There's just, there's nothing romantic about it. It's real people with feelings and emotions, but just through your life so quickly. How is this healthy? Just, no, no, no. Just a stream of human sorrow, one after another. Like, not good enough. Do you know who I am? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I signed up. Uh, it changed my life. I went from feeling pretty good about myself to feeling like a leper alone in a room typing. That's what I felt like. Just, oh look, she likes the outdoors too. I can't believe how many people like the outdoors online. It really blows my mind. There are a lot of hypocrites on the internet at home with carpal tunnel syndrome typing about their love for hiking. Am I wrong? Maybe I'm being harsh, I don't know. I tried speed dating. If one rejection a week isn't enough for you, you should give this a go. Because 30 an hour is a real rush. It really is. It, it feels like... It feels like emotional whack-a-mole to me. It's just like, stay down! I believe in romance. Meeting people is hard. But I know, I know we have to do it. These people over here, they all met through apps. <laughs> totally working for them. These people over here don't need apps. They're just supremely confident. <laughs> well, some of them might be bluffing. Some of them might be putting up a front, but that doesn't matter, because it's all working for them. Meanwhile, I'm well, you know, observing, trying to figure this out. Objectively, objectively, I could never figure out why, why looking at a person should be any more interesting than looking at any other thing, like, say, a bicycle or a beautiful sunset or a mm, nice bag of potato chips. But yeah, looking at people, that's the best. <laughs> What about your device dictatorship that you live under, cowering in fear from your phone? Oh, my phone, where's my phone? I can't find my phone. It's just, oh, here it is, I got it, it's here. It's here, my phone is here. I didn't, I moved it from this pocket to this pocket. I didn't know where it was for a second. I'm okay, that was really close. You are so hypnophonified at this point. You hand your phone to somebody to show them something. After two seconds, you go, all right, can give me back, give it back. You saw it. That, that's it. Give it back. I am completely off the grid right now. <laughs> when that battery gets low, you feel like your whole body's running out of power, don't you? I just, I, I feel tired when the phone battery gets down to like 10 or 5. I can't even walk. You guys go ahead without me. I got to get to a charger. <laughs> we are not separating from the phone. It's a part of us. Now, who are you with no phone? What access to information do you have? What you can remember? <laughs> what are you going to do without your pictures? Are you going to describe what you saw? <laughs> that doesn't work for us. We don't want to talk to anybody that doesn't have a phone. That's why it's called an iPhone. It's half myself, half phone. That's a complete individual. 
I don't even know what the purpose of people is anymore. I think the only reason people still exist is phones need pockets to ride around in. I used to think Uber was on my phone so I could get around. Then I started thinking maybe they put Uber on the phone because that makes me take the phone because the phone is using me to get around. Who's really the Uber in this big prostitution ring? I'm the little bitch carrying the phone. The cars are the hoes picking up strangers off the street all night. And the phone's the big pimp of the whole thing telling the drivers, you just get who I tell you to get. I'll handle the money. <laughs> we call it a phone. We don't even use it as a phone. Nobody's talking on the phone. Once they gave you the option, you could talk, you could type. Talking ended that day. It's over. <laughs> Talking is obsolete. It's antiquated. I feel like a blacksmith up here sometimes, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I could text you this whole thing. We can get the hell out of here right now. <laughs> Why would I want to get information from a face when I could get it from a nice, clean screen? Don't you feel uncomfortable now faces come up to you? Well, I'll tell you what I think that way I look. Oh, yeah. Their lips and their teeth and their gums and their... There's a misshaving spot, there's a piece of crust, some goo, you see a little lunch remnant in their teeth. Just send me an email about this, would you? I can't do it anymore. Your face is the worst news I've had all day. We want to tax, tax, just tax. We like that word, don't we? Tax. It's fun to say, it's got that Short, tight, got the X in there, a little bite to it. Text it! Text, don't, I don't, I don't know where it is. Don't tell me, text it, don't tell me. <laughs> remember when we first got texts? Not really, can't really remember that. I, I can't either. I mean, I know that we have it. I know we didn't used to have it. I don't know how we got it, I don't remember. Did they tell us we were getting it? There was, was there an announcement that we're getting it? There was no commercial. I don't remember a commercial. Want some human contact, but kind of had it up to here with people. Try tags. Need to get someone some information, but don't want to hear their stupid voice responding to it? You need to be on tags. We like it. It's fast. It's efficient. Not fast enough, apparently, for some people. Now, instead of OK, a lot of people texting me just the K, <laughs> leaving the O off. What? What micro fraction of a second did you save? You think you're efficient? What does that add up to like two free minutes at the end of your day that you can watch a YouTube video of skateboarders banging their nuts off a railing? <laughs> Somebody texted me TY the other day instead of thank you. I'd like to bang your nuts off a railing, TY. <laughs> That's not a thank you. We're so anxious to get the next text, they give you those three little ghosty dots to tell you it's coming. Oh, we're cooking up a good one for you. Wait till you see this. You are not going to believe what this guy's about to say. I can't show it to you yet. We're still working on it in the text machine, but it's going to be a beauty. You can see the pistons pumping. Sometimes we get the ghosty dots, and then no text. What happened there? I want to know what that was. Is that like somebody coming up to you and going, uh, never mind. <laughs> the phones keep getting smarter. Why don't we? Why are people on voicemail still telling me to wait for the beat? It's the 21st goddamn century. I think we're all up to speed on the beat. The Maasai tribesmen of the African plain know about the beat. They don't leave a message till they hear, mamale, 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 beep. Why are people still telling me to leave my name and number on voicemail? Are these necessary instructions for anyone? Anyone getting messages like, this is a woman. Goodbye. <laughs> or, he's dead, call me back. Who was that? <laughs> what about the uh, camera 
in the phone. I always wonder if they, before they do those kinds of things, do they stand around and go, hey, are you sure this is a good idea? You don't think this one feature all by itself could result in so many pictures, videos, posting, comments, and clapbacks that the entire life force of the human race just drains out like a puddle of piss by the side of the road. You don't think that could happen from this one thing. Please stop. Stopping good vibrations by the Beach Boys. Ophelia. Ophelia, call the police. Sure. Playing Fuck the Police by NWA. Fuck the police coming straight from the underground. The young nigga got it back because I'm brown. You reject, like, artificial things. Sometimes technology kind of challenges you. And you're like, wait a minute. Yeah. I'm, I, I was here first. Right. You, how are you going to tell me what to do? Ah, see, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. We all were here before the technology. Yeah. I mean, my iPhone said, time to wake up. And I was like, <laughs> listen, buddy, I'll <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How you gonna tell? I'm already awake, first yeah. of all, so you wrong. <laughs> So yeah, I, I was like, how, how dare you? So I put it in a drawer. I'm also not very funny over text or like, I'm not great in that space. Yeah. Like, I'm like, uh, you know, like get me in a let's room. Me let's meet up. Let's, let's meet up and face chat. To face. Yeah. That's um, where you're gonna shine. That's where I'm gonna shine, <laughs> yeah. Holly B. That first season, and she was talking about this thing called Twitter. And I, and, and as she explained Twitter, I was like, what is this nonsense? This is, I, I don't want to yeah. have a, a Twitter account and you tweet. What is this bird yeah. thing? Like, it, it, like explaining it to me, which is why I'm not a technological genius, but like explaining it to me was <laughs> such a foreign concept and I was just so patently uninterested. That's something that actually years later, man, I think we got to give credit to Gossip Girl. Like it was in a way like a futuristic concept. It was, it was trying it was to get at it. social media before social media. It really was. I mean, it was, it really tapped into something interesting on the cusp of, of it all changing. I mean, Instagram came out after, but I'm like, why would I want to put my life out there? I'm trying to <laughs> crawl into my hermit shell, you know, I'm a cancer. Yeah. Why, why am I trying to... <laughs> right. But, um, but now we all, we're all uh, partaking, you know, it's a part of the part of the oh, business, man. right? <laughs> I'm doing this on my phone, otherwise I would follow you right now. I'll follow you after. <laughs> Your character has so many problematic, um, you know, issues in a way to him. Can you tell me a little bit about, though, why you think your character treats women that, the way that he does? Because he doesn't really mean to do bad things, but it's just kind of innate in him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's conditioned to do so by a lot of things, by his, you know, his upbringing, by his father, or, you know, lack of a presence of. And, um, and you know, something I talked to Tom about is that he also, like, physically, you know, he emulates what he sees in porn. So he takes a lot of shit from the internet. That's kind of the way it, it works a lot of the time now. You know, a lot of young people. Yeah, so a lot of young people now, I mean, do you think that is kind of an actual real issue that you're touching on yeah. here? Absolutely, yeah. There's also a thing today where we're, we're, we're giving them access to information way quicker. So there's gotta, this is not something that's been studied, right? Like what happens to a young mind when it has access to almost anything as soon as you get a phone. You're given 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds phones, and then they have access to everything in the world, everything. Any, Porn porn instantly which i you know you're talking to a libertine but i do not think porn is benign well, i do not it is not benign not the, not the, the way it is now on the computer i mean it's it's rapey it's um it's it's what a sites are you going to any any site i'm not getting the rapey porn but well, i think it's well, not it's, benign because oh, please it's not it's not it's domineering Yes, it's a lot of things that I am not interested in, even in my fantasies. I was doing a, a bit about that in my last special. Like, even in my fantasies, I don't want to choke anybody. Yeah. I, I don't want to come on your face. I mean, come on, coming on your face, that that's not... 
rapey oh. or domineering or I mean I I find that off-putting and gross it doesn't that doesn't move me and the thing I don't get it but that's half of what Pornhub is well I think what half of it is now is a lot of stepsister stuff as like stepfather that, stepsister what's step that brother. all about because people are trying to be naughty and there's nothing naughty left because like the idea right. of porn originally was like I can't believe these people are having sex like go back and watch porn from the 80s so they're just having sex ass fucking choking mm -hmm. come on spitting. your face spitting yeah yeah it's gross and it's it, and so uh, I'm not surprised that kids have mental problems <laughs> fucked because, up ideas of sex yeah. yes if i mean what what's a first date a re first real date like right when you saw you know a team of japanese businessmen come on some schoolgirl's face when you were 10. <laughs> dude I, I was not like a good husband i just i was fucked up you know i, I was addicted to porn <laughs> i know billion dollar industry just me right? I was addicted to porn, you know, and you know, I, you know, I, I was 15 minutes late everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I got some witnesses. <laughs> and when you watch too much porn, you know what happens? Here's what happens to you. You, you become like sexually autistic. <laughs> you, be, you develop like sexual autism. You have a hard time with eye contact and verbal cues you want everything to be routine like you can't choke your woman every night you gotta mix it up choke out thursday <laughs> and what happens to you, you watch too much porn you get desensitized you know it's like when, when you start when you start watching porn it's like any porn will do god they're naked Ooh. then later on now you all fucked up and you need a perfect porn cocktail <laughs> to get you off, you know? I was so fucked up, like, I need an Asian girl with a black girl's ass that speaks Spanish. <laughs> Just to get my dick to move an inch. <laughs> Dude, I, I was married for 16 years. Married for 16 years, yes. That's a long run. Hamilton won't last that long. <laughs> I was married for 16 years in the era of the cell phone, which means my 16 years is actually longer than my parents' 40. That's right. In 16 years, I had more contact with my ex-wife than my parents did in 40 years. Okay, my father used to leave for work at 6 30 in the morning and come home at 8 30 at night and during the day him and my mother had absolutely no contact <laughs> at all none okay that's what a relationship used to be the kids could have been dead <laughs> and he wouldn't have found that shit out till he got home he'd be like hey the kids are dead what time they die about eight hours ago, damn, I missed it. <laughs> yes, that's right. You know what else? They actually missed each other. They missed each other. You know, you can't miss nobody in 2017. Not really, you can say it, but you don't really miss a motherfucker because you with them all the time. They in your fucking pocket. <laughs> As soon as you leave, man, as soon as you go somewhere, you get a fucking text, you get a ping, you get a beep, you get a fucking Facebook, an Instagram, you get something, you know, a FaceTime. And then later on, your woman goes, you act like you don't want to talk. <laughs> man, what the fuck are you talking about? I know everything you did today, <laughs> and I know how people felt about it. <laughs> I gave you five likes, bitch. <laughs> I gave you three smiling faces and an eggplant. <laughs> he said he woke up in the middle of the night because he heard noise in the bathroom, but he didn't check to see where his woman was. He didn't even look. Come on, guys. 
You look, you wake up, and the first thing you do is you see where your woman is. And if your woman's not in bed, and you're a real man, your first thought is, oh shit, where's my cell phone? That's your first thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't even go to the bathroom, I go to the top of the steps. Baby, you got my phone? You downstairs, you got my phone? Stop fucking around, give me my phone. My woman's always in my shit. I had to have some eye pajamas made. I had pajamas made with a pocket so I could get some sleep, you know? I had pajamas with a passcode made and shit. But she's the Copernicus of getting in a phone. She getting a motherfucker's phone no matter what phone you got. I remember when I used to have passcode digits. I woke up one night and I heard, this is what I heard. I was like, what the fuck is that? I look on the side of the bed, she's got my phone doing this. That's some slick shit. Yeah, oh, y'all know that up here, you ladies. Y'all ain't shit, yeah, y'all know that. You breathe on the phone and fog it up and you can see the most frequently tapped password numbers. Yeah, you're like, uh-huh, that's his father's birthday right there, that's what that is. Oh, she's a trip. Hey, I woke up, I woke up one night and she had my phone, she was over me and had my thumb too. And she was doing this <laughs> on the new phone. I'm like, hey, hey, give me my shit. <laughs> You're not gonna bust me with my own fucking thumb. <laughs> Nigga can't even get an ambient nap in this motherfucker. <laughs> and I smell pee. <laughs> now I got the Facial recognition. <laughs> it's gonna take her at least a week. Because <laughs> eventually she'll figure this shit out. Yeah. It was the texting! Fuck! Oh! Who invented texting? Who invented texting? It wasn't a woman. No, let me tell you. Because texting shows exactly how crazy a bitch really is. Yeah, ladies, it's in right now. You always wonder why your man calling you a crazy ass bitch? Go back and read some of your texts. <laughs> you will see that you are a psycho. <laughs> you know we don't appropriately use that shit. We'll pick the phone up in a minute and be like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. You need to respect me. You need to R-E spec me. Cause I keep it 100. Then we do that emoji, that 100 emoji. 100, 100, 100, sin. But we women, we're emotional. An hour later we're like, I am so sorry about that text. <laughs> It was unnecessary <laughs> and immature. <laughs> but that's why I love you, babe. Because you know that I'm passionate. <laughs> Are we still going to hook up tonight? Because <laughs> it ain't like it used to be in the good old days. You remember good old days, the answer machine? Oh, man, that's when stalking used to be so pure. <laughs> like, you can call and leave a fucked up message. Fuck you! Fuck your mama! I'm gonna fuck your homeboy, Tony, and your dick small. <laughs> call back, figure out the code, erase the message. Do that shit six, seven times, he don't even know you crazy. <laughs> Not texting, that shit is instant. That shit go right to the motherfucker. You can't cancel it, you can't pull it back, you can't do shit. What we need is an app. We need an app. So when we talking shit like that, the app be like, uh-huh. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. 
you sure you want to send that shit out? <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. You are at 85% crazy right now. Mm -hmm. We gonna send you a picture of your face of what it looked like right now. Or while you texting the one that you love, your face not supposed to look like that. And you get a, pay, you get a, a picture from the, from the app and your face is like. But you still send it. Cause it's so easy, you guys. It's so easy to pick the phone up and be like, you's a bitch and so is your mom, send. I didn't have to call your mama, bitch. <laughs> Gladys is one of the nicest people I have ever fucking met in my life. She's so nice. Every time I go over there, she's so fucking nice. Please tell Gladys that I love her. Sin. Are you getting any of your texts? Because I've been texting you all day, question marking you and shit. That's why I don't fuck with you, because you ain't shit. You ain't worth the salt in your motherfucking bread. I swear, fuck you and everything that you stand for. The fucking horse you rode in on. Fuck you, you piece of shit. Sin. There I go again. <laughs> Always going the fuck off and don't know what the fuck I'm going off for. You might be busy, you might be at work, you might be asleep. Are you asleep? <laughs> but that's why I love you, babe. Because you know I'm passionate. Naked picture, naked picture, naked picture, naked picture, naked picture, naked picture, naked picture. Sin. I'm outside. Sin. Cause we cry. You know what else fake. is frustrating? When what? you when you get a, a, an alert, like a text, like, oh, I've got a text, and you find, you're like, oh, there's nothing here, and then you realize that someone has just put a, like, a little heart or explanation points <laughs> or a thumbs up or a thumbs down on somebody's something, and you're like, you really just couldn't write something like a heart? Or, or, like, I had to search through, and then you have to find figure out who left that heart or thumbs up, thumbs down. Oh, you can't. It takes way more time than just actually writing a comment to what the person last said. You're right, said. In, in, in trying to save it's time, lazy. we're wasting a huge amount of time. Of our time. Yeah. yeah. And now you are going to waste a huge amount of your time of people's looking time. at Instagram uh, because you get sucked into it. Yeah. And you'll, oh, you will get sucked into it, oh, absolutely. God, well, you've just put a curse on me. You've just said you will be sucked into it. Uh, I'm going to try to be really, you know, how like often do you it. post? Do you know? Have you thought about that? I haven't uh, thought about that. You haven't thought about it? Yeah. You know you have to put up another well, one. Well, here's the... I do. I know yeah. that after... <laughs> like yesterday, they were like, okay, well, and I was like, I have to do more now, I guess. This is, this is now a You do have thing. to do more. It's yeah. the law. It's now you're the in. Law. Yeah, I talk about arguments about on Twitter. Right? The worst people have... Twitter is, is well, amazing. Well, it... <laughs> Why do you get into arguments on Twitter? Well, because it's fun. It's like research <laughs> for me. As a, I love it, you know. I actually go looking for trolls because I don't, I don't really get them. And it, the good thing about Twitter is it's like, it's like looking at every toilet wall in the world at once. So you can really find proper crazes. Right? Yeah, and yeah. I, and I and I and I wind them up. Everything from just uh, it's just mad fundamentalists to just people who live in a bin. You know what I mean? 
and, and you, that you, that and you, that you do it. And I, I just, I wind them up. I, I, and you should have just left it. But I, yeah. I, I, yeah, and I get into arguments with them. I, I, the running thing is I should have left it. Um, but um, you know, some I, of the 24 followers. Like, yeah, exactly. Getting in a major fight with Well, them. I got into a fight after doing this show. Roberts also admits social media can get her down. She just got on the gram because her kids asked her to. But this pic with her niece got some online hate. The number of people who felt absolutely required to talk about how terrible I looked at the picture, that I'm not aging well, that I look like a man, I was amazed at how that made me feel. I'm a 50-year-old woman, and I know who I am. And still, my feelings got hurt. As someone who crafts lyrics for a living, is there a poetry in hashtags, or is it all just kind of bullshit? Um, I think that all social media is pretty much total baloney. So that's why I treat it like that. It's a terrifying space. If you're at home watching, not knowing what to make of this because you haven't checked Twitter yet to see how you feel, <laughs> um, you can... <laughs> no. It's okay, trust me, I already looked. You think it's delightfully refreshing. <laughs> Okay, so cancel culture as a form of accountability. I can't believe I need to make this video, but we're gonna do it anyway. Uh, accountability doesn't need to be public. That's the first thing. Public humiliation isn't necessary to hold someone responsible. You decided that upon yourself, so let's get that out of the way. The second thing is, this is Twitter we're talking about. This is one of the easiest places to fabricate drama, okay? So if we're talking about accountability here, at the end of the day, accountability is just coming from a bunch of streamers that don't know the full story. So, and the thing that I find interesting about that is a lot of the people that I see participating in cancel culture tend to be the same folks who preach about social justice. So if you are someone that is passionate about equality and fairness, I find it very hard to believe that you think publicly crucifying someone with little to no evidence would seem like a logical thing to do. Furthermore, Bad opinions are subjective. What's deemed problematic to you isn't gonna be problematic to somebody else. And that's why a lot of cancel culture mobs result in the accuser gaining more attention, more publicity, because at the end of the day, your criticism is just that, publicity. But you know what also happens in regards to cancel culture? Suicide. Yeah, suicide. A very common result of public humiliation. If you care about someone, you're going to set them up for success by putting them in a position to rehabilitate themselves. What do you think inciting an online mob is gonna do? What do you think? You think it's gonna help them? You think it's gonna make them feel like a better person after being publicly berated like that? Is that really what you think? If you are on the receiving end of cancel culture, and this is coming from someone that has experienced it myself multiple times, it chips away at your dignity. It chips away at your self-confidence, at your mental health. So if that's the goal, then by all means, label it as accountability and be on your way. But that's not what's happening, okay? What is reality and what you think you're doing are two entirely different things. Cancel culture will never be an option for sustainable accountability all you're doing is bullying there is a reign of terror it's not that all of thinking america is coming to feel that battling power differentials is supposed to be the only thing that the intelligent person is truly concerned about that's not what most people think because it's a very controversial difficult to defend position what people are realizing is that you have to pretend to think that way in order not to be called a racist on Twitter, in order to not have your job threatened, in order to be able to hold your head high at the neighborhood get together. That's not good. And there are signs from what I see that this, happen this is happening in other parts of the world. And it frightens me because it's not a revolution. It's backwards. Social media has allowed a backwardsness to spread throughout thinking people in America and beyond, not to mention people who are not reading the New York Times, people who are not reading you know, their Spiegel, et cetera, but people who are living their lives and hearing you know, from outside that we are supposed to have these power differentials at the very heart of existence and having no idea quite what to do with it. All of this worries me, and I think someone needs to stand up against it. I think it's gradually happening. And I think it's important that among the people who stand up against it are people of color such as me. I am fully aware that as a black American, my saying this will be interpreted by some people, including black ones, as disloyal, as my not understanding something about how power differentials work. But I actually 
I do, and I'm very committed to battling power differentials and injustice. However, I don't think that it should be the very centerpiece of everything that we do and think about. Because when that happens, we're back to the Middle Ages. I read that <laughs> for you, life was really better before iPhone. Yes. Why? Because people talk to each other. And because you could walk into a room full of people and everyone's looking into each other's eyes at the dinner table, in a room, at a party. Now you go out and everyone's looking at their phone and not talking to each other. And that's one thing from a social perspective, but also from a creative perspective. Um, it was great to be able to develop as an artist, a singer, a songwriter, to, to develop my own style, to, you know, what I wanted to look like, dress like, everything was, I mean, I just did it on my own. I didn't have any thing to compare myself to. I didn't have any pressure from the outside world. There was nothing to look at. If you walked into any restaurant, any restaurant during lunchtime, and you see people on their phones, it's like, this is bonkers. This is, if this was anything else, <laughs> yeah. that where half the room was using a, an electronic and staring into it for long moments at a time, not interacting with the person across from them, like that becomes almost the norm? Yeah. That like at least 50% of the people, and everyone's interrupting everybody, like, you know, they're all just barely paying attention to each other. Yeah. Well, they haven't developed the muscle. I mean, yeah. it's a muscle. You, it, you, it's, people just assume that the ability to have a conversation is a natural part of being an adult, but it's like, you, I think that's atrophying in a lot of people to the point now where I just try to be, you know, as, I guess is like, I just have lowered my expectations yeah. to the point of like, I don't know how many people can pay attention that much. And I know I'm certainly distracted, but doesn't it feel fucking weird? Even if you're just watching TV with somebody and they pull their phone out and start looking at it. Oh, it's so weird. It, it's like it's like the energy immediately downshifts yeah. the moment that it's... Like it's, if you're watching a movie with someone and they're over there on their phone... Like, come on. Yeah. Watch the goddamn movie with me. Yeah. Even though yeah. we're not talking doesn't yeah. mean we're not connecting. It's weird. It's weird. Even fights. If you watch fights with your friends and they're on their phone all the time, it's like, are you not even watching these fights? You can feel it. Yeah. That's yeah. why, you know, at the Denver Comedy Works, they've got the Dave the Chappelle. Yonder bags. Yes. Yeah. So, like, I was listening. Do you ever listen to an audience that doesn't have access to their phones before a show? They're so mad. The one, no, they want, they, they, <laughs> motherfucker, where's my phone? This, no, it's. They talk to each other. Yeah, it's like, it's like the sound is better. It's yeah. a better sound out there. It's a yeah. different murmur than a phone murmur from a yeah. crowd. Because I guarantee you, as funny as you are, it's not as funny on an iPhone yeah, or a TV of as it yeah. is in person or watching yeah. it by yourself. Right. I mean, it is a shared experience. And the number of young people I meet who have never had a shared experience is is amazing to me. I mean, mm -hmm. they grow up, like, yeah. you know, everything is uh, you know on, on uh, social media, right? And they see something, and they go, "Wow, this is kind of wow, this is kind of cool." Everybody comes to this place. The tricky thing for them is going to be connection, and being able to be connected and being able to have uh, real conversation, and uh, you know, even be able to concentrate long enough to to be with somebody. Because of devices? Yeah. I mean, I think it's far. Could you imagine right now if you were 20? No. And being like dating and swiping and trying to pay attention. and Or even 10. You know, my daughter is one of the few girls in her class that doesn't have a cell phone. What's the age that do they get them? Like they're, they're, they've had them since they were like seven. No, I mean, you're my kids, like, what's the rule in your house? There's, there's a debate right now we're trying what's, to figure it out. Well, okay. So you have a 10 year old going to be 11. Yeah. I think that you know, they say there's like a movement. Wait till eighth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You heard that? Yeah. Like 10 kids in the class. All the parents agree. So they're not the only person in the class that doesn't have it. But it's not that way with my daughter's kids, the kids in her class. Most of them have phones. Most parents just give the kid a phone. Yeah. And it's just, um, there's, a. Uh, have you read any of Jonathan Haidt's stuff, yeah. The Coddling of the American Mind? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And that, that is just so disturbing when you see the amount of, especially young girls that are growing up depressed, cutting themselves, oh, self-harm. Yeah. What's um, that, like 400%, he said, like from 10 mm -hmm. to 14? or Something crazy like that. Like something insane. Massive spike that directly coincides with the invention of smartphones and social media. Yeah, the slot yeah. machine. Yeah, it's this... 
this thing where people are just trying to get likes and trying to leverage their, you know, their social status and and try to pretend that they're living in a, a perfect world to everybody around them and everyone else is doing it. And people look at other people's lives being perfect and they reflect upon their own. They get depressed. There's just so many factors that kids didn't have to deal with just yeah. a, a decade or so ago. It's really, really And it's really never new. off, right? Nope. Like at least if I had a hard time at school, I could go home and have a reprieve from it at least yeah. overnight. I think for me, this, that's been a thing with my kids is like, because especially daughters, I do think, I understand the gaming is different for boys and pornography and things like that and that whole trip of rewiring their brain. And But I think with girls, it's like, how do you get them to under, like get, hear their own voice? I don't know how they're going to get to a place where they... I mean, because every it's like this weird mishmash of like me too, and then never before had people objectified themselves more because they get that mm. that positive affirmation. Like I always say, if I put out really smart ideas, um, if I'm a young woman, oh, I have a thousand followers. Every shot is of my butt. I have 10 million followers. <laughs> so we have this mixed message going on, which is like, I'm angry, me too, treat me equal, simultaneously to. I'm going to objectify myself in the most hardcore way more than in any time in history. With and spectacular I, results. And it's really, it blo for me as a female who, who understands both those sides a little bit, um, I, it kind of trips me out. Because yeah. I don't think you, like those girls, you know, playing that card and have, no violence should be done to you. And I agree with all of that and no is no and all of that. But at a certain point, you know, like you've had Jordan Peterson on here many times. It's like biological signaling. It's like, what, like play aside at least. And mm -hmm. also, that 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 one side is super short lived. That's what I try to tell my girls. I'm like, yo, listen, if you're, you know, you're pretty girls, it's great. But if that's the card you're playing, your card's done. Like by the time you're 30, 35, it's done. It's over. Um, you know, unless you're like 40 and you marry a seven-year-old. I don't know, or whatever. Or get into MILF porn. Is that such a thing? Yeah. Yeah, but even that, it's like, <laughs> they got to put a filter on it and like all that stuff. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? It's I like, do. at no, a certain point, how do you get these girls to go, hey, stand up for yourself, be strong, but like, what are you doing? But look at all these people that are not doing that, that are benefiting. I know, but it's getting them to understand how do you get a 13-year-old to talk about the long game? Right. Yeah, I mean, everything's right. immediate. But for me, it's like, it's uh, culturally, I feel like I'm this weird mix of like the most, I came through at the most modern time, like women went to school and on scholarships and like we, we there was no thought to being like strong, not really. Mm -hmm. And then, but then weirdly, it's like I feel so kind of old-fashioned when I see kind of this next thing because I'm like well strong for me was something else strong was like you were really sh physically strong trying to have a strong mind you know strong basis of a person and then okay then there was this other side like your femininity your sexuality all this other stuff and now it's like I don't know I it's very interesting right? well there's certainly a bunch of different kinds of people right and there's going to be people that gravitate towards objectifying themselves there's yeah. kind of people that gravitate in this day and age towards you know you see a lot of people's pages are just filled with motivational quotes and inspirational right. things and you know and, and stories about people that they meet and photos and you get a lot of people that are attracted to that kind of stuff too it's just you're not going to get the immediate gratification of a picture of your ass the, the, that picture of your ass that gets 100,000 likes, you're like, wow, look at all those likes. Yeah. And then, you know, it's just a different vibe. And you have to decide, what are you after? Are you after quantity or quality? Are you after, are you trying to accurately express how you feel and, and work it out through communicating with people and figure out how they react to what you're saying and how you feel about how other people say similar things and how it does good things for you and you want to do good things for them? Or do you just want to have... my butt. A, yeah, just have a piece of dental floss up the crack of your ass. Yeah. Sticking it in front of the camera. This, you know. No, and I, I get that. Like, I get also, like, I always say when you're a young woman, you sort of get this new car, and you're like, well, what happens? Like, what if I put my foot on the gas? Like, <laughs> you're sort of checking it all out. Like, yeah. ooh, they respond like this if sure. I do that. Like, that's completely natural. Mm -hmm. But then at a certain point, um, I don't know that the input is like, uh, you know, like, who do you want to be? As a culture, we don't know what to do 
with boredom, you know, because we're never without the world at our fingertips. Yes. You know, so like I remember my mom, I have such vivid memories of, parents would never do this today, but like take, we'd go to the market and she would leave me in the car. <laughs> and she would go to the market and it felt like she was gone for five days. She yeah. was probably looking back on it, she was probably gone for 20 minutes. But it felt like forever. And I'm in that car as a little boy. I can remember it vividly. And all I have is my mind and my imagination to kill the time. That's it. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's, it served me very well. But I, I don't know how many of us are getting that experience today. Not too many. I mean, grown adults are very rarely bored these days. And I think that, that leads to a real problem with, like, creativity and imagination. And also social media anxiety and all the the nonsense that comes with just reading people's anger and that this the way we I'm off tw- I'm off other. Twitter I don't I, I still have a presence on it and I still use use it from here to there but I I'm I'm um, I did good for you. and I didn't do the thing that makes me crazy is it's like I'm leaving Twitter everyone <laughs> it's like shut the fuck up exactly just go Oh, yeah. Stupid. Do you know what I mean? At, and then you check to see how people are reacting to you leaving Twitter. Yeah. Let me see what the how the, what kind of interest that post generated. Yeah. I just and I'm way happier. Yeah, there's so many people that are just so addicted to saying something and seeing how people react to it. Oh, what's it trending? I loved it. Oh. I love checking what's trending on Twitter. It's yeah. fucking best. Yeah. It's just in this time and age too with Trump, it's just a terrible time because everyone's so angry. You go on Twitter and it's just people are so furious. They just you can't have an opinion about anything. Everybody's mad. If you do have an opinion, there's a million people that disagree and a million people that do agree and they're fighting it out to the death. Yeah. It used to be that um, consensus building or or being in the, in the middle of the the road was accepted by the warring camps. Right. And and now um, that's it's silence is com- is complicit. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that. So that's that's really the problem. That's why there's no there's there's no middle anymore. Right. People are angry at you if you don't post an opinion that agrees with them. Like you can't even have you can't even not post an opinion. They'll get mad at you. Like I've heard people say, you know, hey, history will not be kind to the people that did not talk about this. I'm like really? Like what? The, what? <laughs> You yeah. can't tell people that they have to comment on things. That's ridiculous. You're f- you're forcing people to express opinions that they might not have even formed. Yeah, it's it's a it's an it's a. I mean, I have these talks with my boys because they're right in the thick of it. They're, it's a new generation, obviously, and and they have a totally different perspective on it. Um, they're growing up with it. They don't even know what it's like to have no internet. Wow, it's amazing. That's what's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. I remember I remember vividly when like like when it all happened. I remember like. I was on the West Wing, and like all of a sudden, we had went from pagers to blackberries. Mm. I remember the first the first person who ever showed me an iPhone was David Crosby, of all people. Oh wow! Yeah, and I was like, "What is that thing you have got there?" And he had the, one of the first iPhones. I wouldn't. I was a late adopter, because I was like, "That's bullshit. I want buttons." I was late at same. I wanted buttons, and I thought that it was somehow an iPhone was less serious than a BlackBerry. Right. I'm like, a business person. I'm a, I'm a serious person. Yes. I'm not, I'm not, you know, and, and, and then I, I um, obviously succumbed. Everybody that I worked with on news radio had the BlackBerry that was the wide one that you did the two finger one. Yes. You know, everyone's doing their email off of it. It's very important to have a BlackBerry. Very. Serious. BlackBerry. Yes. And then they were called, they were called something else in the East, East Coast. Of the, really? Yeah, it was like a rim. Rim, rim was the company, and that's a, that's one of those great. I wanna, I would love to do an uh, anthropological look at how they get the clock cleaned. They had it. Oh yeah, they had it. They all. They had it all. Yeah. Maybe they're gonna say that about iPhone someday. Yeah, somebody will come up. But like, what? How do you? How does? It's like via VHS Betamax. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's like. Who who is this Darwinism of the corporations is so interesting to me. Well, we remember Blockbuster Video. Oh yeah. Who would have ever thought there would be no video stores? Who would have ever thought that? I thought it was a novelty, the idea you're gonna have things on a hard drive. Like what? I know. It's ridiculous. I remember some, the first person telling me, I have my music on my computer. I was like, What do you mean you have your music on the computer? He said, Yeah, no, I don't have any CDs, they're all here. I, 
but where are your CDs? I don't have any. But wait, wait. Like, it shows right. you why – this is why we need ayahuasca because we can't understand simple shit like that. Mm. Well, the real question is what's next? Who gives a fuck if you can code <laughs> if you start crying because your boss didn't say hi? Yo, the internet is making people so fucking stupid. Like, who knew all of human knowledge could make people dumber? <laughs> like, in 50 years, we're gonna look at the internet the same way we look at smoking right now. It's gonna be like, man, I can't believe 50 years ago, we just let pregnant people use the internet. <laughs> what were we thinking? Pregnant people were just using the internet. We use the internet in front of babies. We, l we let babies use the internet. Yeah, in 50 years, we're gonna have special areas outside buildings where you can use the internet. Internet designated zones 50 feet from every entrance. Don't bring the internet indoors. Secondhand stupidity is the real killer. <laughs> Yeah, we're stupid, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been living in America for a while now. It's been great. Uh, there's so much stuff here. There's so much stuff in America. There's so much abundance. It's, it's hard to see if you've been born and raised here, but when you come from somewhere else, it's so obvious. The abundance in this country, out of control. So much stuff. Every day, new stuff. It's like Christmas, every day. <laughs> Hyperloops, electric cars, SpaceX, robot vacuums, iPhone 8s and 10s at the same time. <laughs> Can't even wait in America. We get the iPhone 8, we're like, you know what? Fuck 8 and fuck 9, 10. Let's go. <laughs> Just skipping iPhone models. So much stuff. There's so much food in America. There's so much food every. There's food. So much, there's so much content. So much content. Oh my God, so much content on demand. So many screens. The most screens per capita in the world. Every night in America is like a competition to see how many screens we can get between our face and the wall. Right? It's like iPhone, iPad, laptop, TV, and then Apple Watch. Okay? As many, as many screens in a row as I can get in front of my face. I need a screen below my eyes and a screen above my eyes. <laughs> so when I look down and I look up, I don't miss any of the action. In this Game of Thrones episode that cost $30 million, but for some reason we couldn't figure out how to adjust the contrast, and so everything is dark as fuck. <laughs> Amazon Prime every day. Send that shit to my house every day. Never leave your house in America. Never leave your house. Land of the free and land of never leaving your house. No item too trivial. No quantity too small. To be hand delivered into your home like an emperor, anything. Anything in the world that comes to mind, any fleeting thought you have while drunk, anything. <laughs> I want one pen. <laughs> I want one. I don't want a box. I want just one pen. I want it in a box with some plastic. Throw some napkins in there. In another box. In a bigger box. 50 million boxes flying across America at all times, the airspace above America is just Amazon Prime. <laughs> Packaging, just knocking into each other. Like satellite debris, right? More, more Prime. Can't get enough Prime here. We need it Prime, we need Prime harder, faster, stronger. Faster Prime, Prime now. Prime now, two hour delivery. Prime now, give it to me. Now, 
when I press buy, put the item in my hand. <laughs> now, in America, there should be no lag, zero lag, between when I press the button and when the item is gently placed into my hand so I can use it now. Oh, same day delivery? Oh! Un American. Same day? Now. Prime now. Break into my house. And put the food I ordered in my mouth. And help me chew it. And then push it down my esophagus with a stick. And then pull the feces out of my anus for me now. It's like, where do we go from here? As a civilization, like how much more convenience can we get? How much less energy can we use to get what we want? Let's get Prime before. <laughs> Send it to me before I want it. <laughs> it's 2019, I have to make a decision? Before you mail me what I buy? Use artificial intelligence <laughs> to substitute my own intelligence <laughs> so I can live my life. Send me everything I want before I want it. In as many boxes as possible. And also, you know, it appears to be kind of the apocalypse at the moment. Like, well, it's it's if it's not the apocalypse, I don't think it's the apocalypse. I think it's just a dangerous, dangerous illness. But it's definitely a dress rehearsal. It's a dress yeah. rehearsal for fucking people are going to become preppers. It is going to be amazing for the toilet paper industry. They're gonna they're gonna experience a banner year. If but you got toilet paper stock, you're riding high right now. Do you remember? The, I don't know if you if you had this experience, but like I can remember sitting at my computer and pressing the button on Amazon where I wanted to buy something. And it's like, this isn't available right now. <gasps> In that moment of like, what? It's my button that brings me things. And then like suddenly just realizing like, oh my fucking God, how completely weak have I become that I got accustomed to pressing this button and people would bring groceries to my house yeah. and now they don't. Now it's like stopped. Not only that, I'm so accustomed to like, well, you know, I'll just go to the grocery store and pick up some food. It's always been there. It's not there. Dude, I had an Instacart delivery today, you know, because we wanted to get stock up on food. I don't know, $200 worth of food. Guess what I got? Strawberries, hummus, and... I think we got like, I don't know, some like eggs. That's it. Out of the whole order, everything else was sold out. All the beef gone, all the chicken gone. Nothing's there. It's like the, the shelves are empty. So it's like, okay, send everybody $2,000 a month. But what are they going to buy if there's like no food on the shelves? Like, what, well, what I you... think that was a temporary freak out where people stockpiled stuff. And I think as long as food keeps getting delivered on a normal schedule, I think that'll normal out. I hope so, man. Yeah, I, th I do. I think that'll normal out. But it just shows you there's so many things in our society that are amazing, like grocery stores, like cell phones, like we can call each other, all this. T but those things are so fragile. Yeah. They're, like, they're, they're so vulnerable. Like if, a, if an emergency happens and everyone wants to call at once, the cell phone system can't handle it. Yeah. Like it's not like you have a phone and you can call anytime you want. And I have a phone, I can call anytime I want. And everyone in the world has a phone they can call anytime they yeah. want. No, if everybody does that, the system is not set up to handle that. That's right. If everybody does that, like, ah! Like that's why if there's an earthquake or a tsunami or anything, everyone's fucked. It's yeah. so hard to make phone calls. Yeah. It's not going to get through. This is not a time where people are lazy. This is a time where the whole world got fucked real quick. Yeah. We yeah. weren't ready for it, and uh, we're going to have to come together. But this is a good time for people to recognize the importance of community. 
It's a terrible time for humanity. It's a terrible time for us and terrible mm -hmm. time for the people that are sick. But it's a really good time for us to understand why community is important. We live in this illusionary world that's provided to us by the culture that we've created where you can just buy things anytime you want. You don't need people. You come home. You watch Netflix. You don't engage with anyone. You get in your car. You barely say hi to anybody at work. We're detached from each yeah. other. And this is the only time ever in life We've been detached from each other, and we're being detached by these goddamn electronics. Yeah. They're sneaking up on us. Yeah. Electronics right. and cars, which is also, you know, it's, an, uh, it's also a creation, a mechanical creation, and now more than ever, they're driving computers. Yeah, man. It's true. What well, I'm trying to say is Ted Kaczynski was right. Oh, my God. We all know that. And I thought that that, I mean, this it's as a business... I don't, I don't know how successful it would be in the current yeah. <laughs> economy, um, but, but it's, it painted a picture of the internet that I personally would prefer to live in uh -huh. um, or live on. Do you want to do you want to explain that now that I've just referenced? Well, I will just say, yeah, it was. I won't. I won't. I won't go into too much detail, but it was a, a vision. I will say again, maybe it's appropriate that we come back to something very topical. It was a vision um, inspired in part um, by the stock markets, which I think many or most people know have something called circuit breakers built into them. Mm -hmm. uh, these have been used <laughs> recently and strangely, um, where if things move too fast and it seems like they're out of control, then the whole system just pauses. It just injects kind of a breather into the system to let people collect their wits, maybe reconsider some choices and then go back to it. And I found it and still find it very strange and very telling that no social network uses these. Like there's no sense if something spins up, you know, let's say you, you um, tweet something ill-advised. You meant to email it to yourself, but instead <laughs> you tweeted it and people were like, Anna said what? And it just takes off and it's picking up, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of retweets. There's nothing in those systems that says, hold on, let's all stop and think about this. In fact, it's the opposite. It says, mm -hmm. go, go, go. Um, so I think I'm with you. I think, I think there's some very strange, actually very strange um, uh, and unnatural mechanisms built into these systems that, that maybe are not appropriate. I think I'm visual. I, I, aren't most people now, though? I mean, I, you, you know, I was talking upstairs. I mean, what is the experience of listening? And when people listen now, are they looking at the same time? Are they doing another task at their computer while listening? I'm, I'm not sure what the act of listening is anymore. But it does beg interesting questions to me, which is, what does it mean to pay attention? Uh, I, I tend to write in short forms, small short forms. I, I, I don't know why I don't think in long-term form. Um, and I still ask myself, what does it mean to be interested as a listener? What are you guys going to do when you listen? Yeah. Look down and get a mag reel made and then it would be cut on a flatbed and, and a day would go by. And now it's like, I'll just sit here while you do this, you know. Um, so it's, it's all very sped up, which is sad in a way. I think, I think th there's less poetry to the process now because the process is not mysterious anymore. I mean, there was an app I just learned about called sample app or something which you could put up and it would tell you all the Kanye West songs that sampled whatever grew from the 1970s that took his inspiration you think or even like the Beatles anthologies which are great as studying devices but darn I mean there's no romance to the idea that they were on their way to a, a good song and, and it took a while to get there now and it's great for us as students to be able to to listen to those things but you know in the days of my father you know he would get up with a clock Right, and watch the clock, and, and, and there was a, it's called the Newman system, I think, to this day, uh, well, punches and streamers, where a punch, would, which would be a, f a round flutter in a film, maybe you guys know this, um, w would be an indication of where you, sh you should try to be, and a streamer would go by, and that's where you had to be. So now you're conducting, and you're behind, and the orchestra's not speeding up, and you're trying to get them to speed up, and here comes the pop, and you're, and you're late to the pop, and here comes the streamer, and you're, oh, you know. I mean, that is, that's, that's some real, real skill, you know, watching a clock and doing it. Now, those skills, I don't think, are necessary anymore, and good in a lot of ways. I don't think you need to read music to, to, to write for film, and that's a good thing, too. That the idea of reading music is, is really a communication skill more than it is a necessary skill. But the music business is in such a bad place that it's very hard for a new Fleetwood Mac to emerge or a new Led Zeppelin or a new, you know, The Who or, you know, all, all the elite bands from the six, eight, late 60s and the 70s. It's very hard now 
um, because there's no money. How can you just take off and play gigs that you're not getting paid for anyway, or so little that just your gas is eating it up, you know? So it's like you can't, you can't do what we could do. We could, you know, we got a little help. They're not giving you any help today. So it's, you know, it's internet piracy. It's killed it. And it's, you know, talk about video killed the radio star. Well, internet piracy killed the video and the radio star. Um, are you aware at all of the current state of surveillance and what, if anything, has changed since your revelations? Yeah, I mean, the, the big thing that's changed um, since I was uh, in, 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 in 2013 is now it's mobile first everything. Um, mobile was still a, a big deal, right? Um, and the intelligence community was very much grappling uh, to, to get its hands around it and to deal with it. Um, but now people are much less likely to use a laptop than use a desktop than, than use, you know, God, any kind of wired phone um, than they are to use a smartphone. Uh, and both uh, Apple and Android devices, unfortunately, uh, are not especially good in uh, protecting your privacy. Think right now. Um, you got a smartphone, right? You, you might be listening to this <laughs> on a train somewhere in, in traffic right now. Um, or, or you, Joe, right now. You, you got a phone somewhere in the room, right? Uh, the phone is turned off, or at least the screen is turned off. It's sitting there. It, it's powered on. And if somebody sends you a message, the screen blinks to life. How does that happen? Right. Uh, how is it that if someone from any corner of the earth uh, dials a number, your phone rings and nobody else's rings? How is it that you can dial anybody else's number and only their phone rings, right? Uh, every smartphone, every phone at all, uh, is constantly connected uh, to the nearest cellular tower. Um, every phone, even when the screen is off, you think it's doing nothing, you can't see it because radio frequency emissions are invisible, um, it's screaming in the air, saying, here I am, here I am. Here is my uh, IMEI, I think it's uh, Individual Manufacturer's Equipment Identity, uh, and IMEI, uh, Individual uh, Manufacturer's um, Subscriber Identity. I, I could be wrong on the, the breakout there, but the, the acronyms are uh, the IMEI and the IMSI, and you can search the, for these things. They're two globally unique identifiers that only exist anywhere in the world uh, in one place, right? This makes your phone different than all the other phones. Uh, the IMEI is burned into the handset of your phone. No matter what SIM card you change to, it's always going to be the same, and it's always going to be telling the phone network it's this physical handset. And the IMESI... Uh, is in your SIM card, right? And this is what holds your phone number, right? It's the, basically the key, the right to use that phone number. And so your phone is sitting there doing nothing, you think, uh, but it's constantly shouting and saying, I'm here. Who is closest to me? That's the cell phone tower. And every cell phone tower with its big ears uh, is listening for these little cries for help uh, and going, all right, I see Joe Rogan's phone, right? I, I see Jamie's phone, I, I see all these phones uh, that are here right now. And it compares notes uh, with the other uh, network towers and your smartphone compares notes with them to go, who do I hear the loudest? And who you hear uh, the loudest is a proxy for uh, proximity, for closeness, distance, right? They go, whoever I hear more loudly than anybody else, that's close to me. So you're going to be bound to this cell phone tower, and that cell phone tower is going to make a note, a permanent record, uh, saying this phone, uh, this phone handset with this phone number at this time was connected to me, right? And based on your phone handset and your phone number, uh, they can get your identity, right? Um, because you pay for this stuff with your credit card and everything like that. Uh, and even if you don't, right, it's still active at your house uh, overnight. It's still active, you know, on your nightstand when you're sleeping. It's still whatever. Uh, the movements of your phone are the movements of you as a person, and those are often uh, quite uniquely identifying. It goes to your home. It goes to your workplace. Uh, other people don't have it. Sorry. Um, and anyway, it's constantly shouting this out, and then it compares notes with the other uh, parts of the network. And when somebody is trying to get to a phone... 
it compares notes, the network compares notes to go, where is this phone with this phone number in the world right now? And to that cell phone tower that is closest to that phone, it sends out a signal saying, we have a call for you. Make your phone start ringing so your owner can answer it. And then it connects it across this whole path. But what this means is that whenever you're carrying a phone, whenever the phone is turned on, uh, there's a record of your presence at that place that is being made and created by companies. It does not need to be kept forever, and in fact, there's no good argument for it to be kept forever, but these companies see that as valuable information, right? This is the whole big data problem that we're running into, and all this uh, information that used to be ephemeral, right? Where were you when you were eight years old, you know? Um, where were you? Where'd you go after you had a bad breakup? You know, who'd you spend the night with? Who'd you call after? All this information used to be ephemeral, meaning it disappeared, right? Like, like the morning dew, it would be gone. No one would remember it. But now these things are stored. Now these things are saved. It doesn't matter whether you're doing anything wrong. It doesn't matter whether you're the most ordinary person uh, on earth. Uh, because that's how bulk collection, which is the government's euphemism for mass surveillance, works. They simply collect it all in advance in hopes that one day it will become useful. And that was just talking about how you connect to the phone network. That's not talking about all those apps on your phone that are contacting the network even more frequently, right? Uh, how do you get a text message notification? How do you get an email notification? How is it that Facebook knows where you're at? You know, all of these things, these analytics, uh, they are trying to keep track through location services on your phone, through GPS, through even just what wireless access points you're connected to because there's a global constantly updated map. There's actually many of them of wireless access points in the world because just like we talked about, every phone has a unique identifier that's globally unique. Uh, every wireless access point in the world, right? Your, your cable modem at home, uh, whether it's in your laptop, every device that has a radio modem has a globally unique identifier in it. Um, and uh, this is a standard term, you can look it up. Uh, and these things can be mapped when they're broadcasting in the air because again, like your phone says to the cell phone tower, I have this identifier, the cell phone tower responds and says, I have this identifier. And anybody who's listening, uh, they can write these things down. And all those Google Street View cars that go back and forth, right, they're keeping notes uh, on whose uh, Wi-Fi is active on this block, right? And then they build a new giant map. So even if you have GPS turned off, right, uh, as long as you're connected to Wi-Fi, uh, those apps can go, well, I, I'm connected to Joe's Wi-Fi, but I can also see his neighbor's Wi-Fi here, and the other one in this apartment over here, and the other one in the apartment here, and you should only be able to hear those four globally unique Wi-Fi access points from these points in physical space, right? The intersection in between the spreads, the domes, of all those uh, wireless access points, and it's a proxy for location. And it just goes on and on and on. We could talk about this for four more hours. We don't have that kind of time. Can I ask you this? Um, is there a way to mitigate ahead. any of this personally? I mean, it, is, <laughs> I mean, shutting your phone off doesn't even work, right? Well, so it, 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 it does in, in a way. It's yes and no. Um, the thing with shutting your phone off that is a risk is how do you know your phone's actually turned off? Um, it used to be uh, when I was in Geneva, for example, uh, working for the CIA. Um, we would all carry, like, drug dealer phones. Uh, you know, the old smartphones, the, or sorry, old dumb phones, they're not smartphones. Uh, and the reason why was just because they had removable, the battery. removable backs yeah. where you could take the battery out, right? right. And the, the one beautiful thing about technology is if there's no electricity in it, right, if there's, there's no go juice uh, available to it, if there's no battery connected to it, it's not sending anything because you have to get power from somewhere. You have to have power in order to do work. Um, but now your phones are all sealed, right? You can't take the batteries out. So there are potential ways that you can hack a phone where it appears to be off, but it's not actually off. It's just pretending to be off, whereas in fact, it's still listening in and doing all this stuff. But for the average person, that doesn't apply, right? And I got to tell you guys, they've been chasing me all over the place. I don't worry about that stuff, right? Um, and it's because if they're applying that level of effort to me, uh, they'll probably get the same information through other routes. Um, I am as careful as I can, and I, I use things like Faraday cages, I turn devices off, but if they're actually uh, 
manipulating the way devices display. Um, it's just too great a level of effort, even for someone like me, to keep that up on a constant basis. Also, um, if they get me, I, I only trust phones so much. So there's only so much they can derive from the compromise. And this is how operational security works. Uh, you think about what are the realistic threats that you're facing that you're trying to mitigate. And the mitigation that you're trying to do is what would be the loss, what would be the damage done to you uh, if this stuff was exploited. Much more realistic than worrying about these things that I call voodoo hacks, right, which are like next level stuff. But for average people, right, uh, this is academic. Uh, that's not your primary threat. Your primary threats are these bulk collection programs. Your primary threat is the fact that your phone is constantly squawking to these cell phone towers, it's doing all of these things, because we leave our phones in a state that is constantly on. You're constantly connected, right? Uh, airplane mode uh, doesn't even turn off Wi-Fi really anymore. It just turns off the cellular modem. Um, but the whole idea is we need to identify the problem. And the central problem with smartphone use today is you have no idea what the hell it's doing at any given time. Like the phone has the screen off. You don't know what it's connected to. You don't know how frequently it's doing it. Uh, Apple uh, and iOS, unfortunately, makes it impossible to see uh, what kind of network connections are constantly made on the device and to intermediate them, going, I don't want Facebook to be able to talk right now. You know, I don't want Google to be able to talk right now. I just want my uh, secure messenger app to be able to talk. Uh, I just want my weather app to be able to talk. But I just checked my weather. And now I'm done with it, so I don't want that to be able to talk anymore. And we need to be able to make these intelligent decisions uh, on not just an app-by-app -app basis, but a connection-by-connection -connection basis, right? You want, let's say you use Facebook, because, you know, for whatever judgment we have, a lot of people might do it. You want it to be able to connect to Facebook's content servers. Uh, you want to be able to message a friend. You want to be able to download a photograph or whatever. But you don't want it to be able to talk to an ad server. You don't want it to talk to an analytics server that, that's monitoring your behavior, right? You don't want it to talk to all these third-party things because Facebook crams their garbage uh, into almost every app that you download, and you don't even know it's happening because you can't see it, right? And this is the problem with the data collection use today is there is an industry that is built on keeping this invisible. Uh, and what we need to do is we need to make the activities of uh, our devices, whether it's a phone, whether it's a computer, whatever, uh, more visible and understandable to the average person and then give them control over it. We have a problem, guys. Uh, this should be a much more simple process. It should be obvious. And the fact that it's not, and the fact that we read story after story, year after year, saying all your data has been breached here, uh, this company's spying on you here, this company's manipulating your purchases or your search results, or they're hiding these things from your timeline, uh, or they're influencing you or manipulating you in all of these different ways, that happens as a result of a single uh, problem. And that problem is an inequality of available information. They can see everything about you, they can see everything about what your device is doing, and they can do whatever they want with your device. But increasingly these corporations own it, increasingly these governments own it, and increasingly we are living in a world where we do all the work, right? <laughs> we pay all the taxes, we pay all the costs, uh, but we own less and less. And nobody understands this better than the youngest generation. Well, it seems like our data became a commodity before we understood what it was. It became this thing that's insanely valuable to Google and Facebook and all these social media platforms. Before we understood what we were giving up, they were making billions of dollars. And then once that money is being earned and once everyone's accustomed to the situation... Um, the story of our lifetimes is how intentionally, by design, a number of institutions, uh, both governmental and corporate, uh, realized it was in their mutual interest to conceal their data collection activities, to increase uh, the breadth and depth of their sensor networks that were uh, sort of spread out through society. Remember, back in the day, intelligence collection uh, in the United States, even in SIGINT, used to mean sending an FBI agent, right, to put alligator clips on an embassy building or, or sending in a, somebody disguised as, as a workman uh, and they put a bug 
in a building, or they built a satellite uh, listening site, right? We, we call these foreign sat or foreign satellite collection. Uh, we're out in the desert somewhere. They, they built a big uh, parabolic collector, um, and it's just listening to satellite emissions, right? But these satellite emissions, these satellite links, were owned by militaries. They were exclusive to governments, right? It wasn't affecting everybody broadly. All surveillance was targeted because it had to be. What changed with technology is that surveillance could now become indiscriminate. It could become uh, dragnet. It could become bulk collection, which should become one of the dirtiest phrases in the language uh, if we have any kind of decency. You clicked a button that said, I agree, because you were trying to open an account so you could talk to your friends. You were trying to get driving directions. You were trying to get an email account. You weren't trying to agree to some 600-page legal form uh, that even if you read, you wouldn't understand. And it doesn't matter even if you did understand, because one of the very first paragraphs in it said, this agreement can be changed at any time unilaterally without your consent by the company, right? Uh, they have built a legal paradigm that presumes records collected about us do not belong to us. The scandal isn't how they're breaking the law. The scandal is that they don't have to break the law. It's people that are being exploited. It's not um, data that's being manipulated. It's you that's being imp uh, manipulated. And this reminds me of something that uh, one of my old friends, uh, John Perry Barlow, um, who served with me uh, at the Freedom of the Press Foundation, I'm the president of the board, uh, used to say to me, um, which is, uh, you can't awaken someone who's pretending to be asleep. We are into expanding neurology, expanding consciousness, the perception until we die. And what do we do? We make somebody a carpenter or a doctor or this, and then for lifelong, they have to do all, always the same patterns. That is killing uh, the neurological, normal, natural development within. That is killing sanity. So we have to get to sanity because pandemias, viruses, the neuro, uh, neurological uh, iPhones affecting us, the el electromagnetic devices we all got. We have to make, we cannot live with the old paradigm no more. It is not uh, able to defy, to confront itself with the existent hazards. The wolf is gone, but the iPhone is there. The wolf is gone and, and, and the radioactivity is there and, and, and the viruses and those are more dangerous than the dinosaurs and the tyrannosaurs because you cannot see them. And, and the people existent right now who are in control, it's through the old paradigm. We can break that paradigm in a day, but we have to show like people like yourself and me we have been uh, gone out of the box and uh, we found new directions. And we will keep on uh, going and showing through our podcast, hey guys, there is, uh, 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 there is a way out and it's exciting. And once you become excited of life again, it's because the sanity gets back, the neurological natural development gets back and you feel it. And that is the basis for health for happiness and for strength, for energy to flow instead of to be narrowed down like a little deer in a little cage. Right now we're tuning the guitar of our identities to these, to like the most terrifying shit, which is the news. So if that's, if and I think many people have become so accustomed to getting their idea of what's happening in reality from the TV, instead of from like how they feel inside, what's going on with their friends and their family that puts people at an incredible disadvantage because yeah. their pond is being rippled by shit you know i was thinking it's like um 
What are those little, not prairie dogs, those, they, they stand and look around at the hawks, you know what I'm talking about? What are those things called? They're like, they're social little marmots or something like that, oh, okay. you know? There was a show like Lemur Palace, I don't remember what they're called, <laughs> something, but they're like, they're like... Uh, they're really cute, I see them at the zoo. They're fucking adorable. Just, they're most, one of the most adorable animals ever. They stand and look, yeah. somehow they ignore all the humans around them and just look in the sky for a hawk. It's yeah. kind of sad, but... That's their life, though. But imagine if that one looking for the hawk had like the internet and could see hawks thousands of miles away <laughs> how anxious all of them would be because he would always be like get underground get underground get underground right. i mean i remember when i was growing up in the old days when the news had an alert that was serious some serious shit went down yep. you would be what the fuck fox news or any of the news stations they have an alert like every four minutes now yeah. dum, 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 alert dum, 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 alert and it's all telling us just what you're saying get underground go inside go inside danger out here danger out here and so we're all like even before this shit we were huddled up a little bit now we can rationalize the huddling you know and that's what we're doing we're just huddling inside right now that's an incredibly vulnerable place to be i mean and to analyze it and go, well, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're machines. We, we are machines. We are machines. Um, we, we're machines trying to understand ourselves, and that's hard. Will, will there one day be a computer that is suffering from anxiety? I reckon so. Hmm. I reckon so. I reckon there'd be a genius computer that's worried about shit. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> <laughs> we're lumps of meat. We're we're chimps with brains the size of a planet. Of course, we go mad and try and kill each other and worry about what's the point. Of course, we do. Is it's overwhelming, and the more you think about it, the more frightening it is. And that's the problem, because our feelings will come out in behaviors, in a short-temperedness, in anxiety, in too much food or wine or time on the Internet. A colleague of mine calls the Internet. She said it's the most effective short-term non-prescription painkiller out there. <laughs> True. And, and it, like every non-prescription painkiller, it also has a lot of side effects. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Terrible ones. The problem is that if you don't know what you feel, you you don't know what your story is. Sure. So you're trying to engage on a, uh, a socio-political level with people or uh, just yes, raising Yes, ultimately uh, an emotional, psychological level because it, it's really, uh, we, we can't know what the problem is unless we know who we are. So anybody who I doesn't know that. their true self, they can't know what the problem is. So uh, there's no winning unless you know who you are. And the only real change can come from within. So when we talk about uh, change, right? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, people think of that as outside themselves. Change outside themselves. They must change and become more authentic. This is why we. Otherwise, uh, the system is going to continue to fail. It's a, it's an addict. It's an addictive culture bottoming out. I, yeah, I I completely agree. So while they seem to understand that Lindsay Lohan has a problem right. of some sort, but they will not say. I have a problem of some sort, but <laughs> it's uh, what I say about Charlie Sheen is. Uh, how many of you are still in denial and, and have the guts to call the rehab center and say, help me, I can't stop watching Charlie Sheen? Right. Because uh, I'm, oh, oh, he's on Channel 7, hold on. Yeah. Because I'm addicted to watching Charlie Sheen. Yeah, because he, I, I, I actually spoke with him. And and uh, the, the type of weird shamelessness around the insanity he's experiencing, the, the, he actually is pushing out self-awareness. He's saying, I will not be aware of what I think implies weakness. Well, he's he's uh, he's he's not altogether wrong with many of the things he says. That's right. The issue of um, his particular, uh, <clears throat> uh, for lack of a better word, at the moment, uh, uh, for his particular behavior, some of the issues underlying his particular behavior uh, are for him to discover and for his friends to help as uh, other friends would. But there, to, to make it a freak show is, is, uh, is, is falling into the trap of uh, your false self. Everybody's an addict right. about something. Right. So, you know, judge not lest ye be judged. So you're saying that culturally we need to, to go through a crying stage. I think culturally we are bottoming out. Right. But like, how does and that self to, How does the self awareness begin? Okay, like, here's I how self awareness begins. Once, once you bottom out, which, by the way, 
No one is willing to admit yet what we're doing is we're fighting against bottoming out. Absolutely. And yet when Charlie Sheen fights against bottoming out, we call that weird. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. But when America does it, that's winning and that's America. So when Charlie Sheen says I'm winning, I'm sorry, isn't that the motto of the American culture? Yeah. We're winners. We're right. going into our third Middle East country. Yeah. North Africa. Right country and yep. two Middle Eastern countries, and pretty soon we'll be taking Hawaii again, just for the hell of it. Yeah, just to, to make it look like we're winning. Yeah, so we're going to be winning. <laughs> yeah. Mission accomplished. We got, we got Hawaii. Yeah, mission yeah. accomplished. Right. So that's America. But, but they can see it. Everybody can see it when Charlie Sheen does it, but they can't see it when they themselves do it. So nothing can get repaired with the lying continuing. It's no different than a family relationship or anything else. It's a lie in the family which is, I'm sorry, you're, you're addicted. You're the one who's addicted to winning and to being the best and to having the best religion and the best of this and the best of that. And, um, so there's no true humility. So, so I'm sorry, there's no true humility and right. gratitude, That's which right. is what an addict has to realize at the bottoming out place. You can't be driven by your ego or your false self. So I think America should be sort of allowed to bottom out because the, right. this is, a, I'm sorry, I, aren't people embarrassing themselves trying to fight this uh, bottoming out thing? Yeah, well, it's, I, it's right. It's compounding the problem. Right, it, it, it's sort of like, uh, it, you're saying that America is like the emaciated crackhead who's wild-eyed saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I don't have a problem. Well, they're saying, in fact, uh, I'm more than fine. We're winning. We're winning, we're still number one. And, right. Um, you know, I, I don't think you can talk yourself into it, which is what spin is in, 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 uh, supposed to do. Talk, we're going to talk you into believing. But that, isn't spin, isn't uh, part of the entertainment uh, complex, part of that's not so much the spin, but the, the way of avoidance? I mean, they're, that they're seeing, like, a, they're part of me thinks, like, I have said it on the show before, haven't we been entertained enough? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to leave now, as a matter of fact. Are you really? But that's it. I bottomed out, right? We no. haven't entertained enough. No, you can't leave so, Gallagher so left. Stop. That would be bad. Yeah. I, I, I don't, no, no, uh, I just mean I don't put myself above any of these uh, issues, so uh, we have been entertained uh, enough. Uh, Was there a moment, though, where you... Uh, uh, we've forgotten that enough is enough. We're living in a love-deficient culture. Everybody's got their head in their phones. Nobody looks at you, and it doesn't hurt you. Like, if you walk into a room and I don't look at you, it doesn't hurt you doesn't you won't even register it not the first time but the 500th time and the 5000th time you'll be going huh i feel weirdly depressed today i wonder why 5000 humans you walk past and even look at you we're not built for that man we're not built for that we're built for connection we're built for love we're built for each other human life is other humans Take what is yours back onto you, sew it back up and seal it, and say, mine. So the other reason to cut people open is not just to keep them locked into the material world, which is metaphysical and metaphorical. Keep them watching the Kardashians and Love Island and scrolling Instagram and lusting after this and that and the other flipping thing. It's also to access their resources. It's a highly narcissistic thing to do. It keeps you controlled. It keeps you locked into this spectrum of reality and it's to access your resources. When I cut you open and your guts are exposed, I can eat whenever I want. I can eat whenever I want. It's like some, I don't know which God did it. I can't remember, but it's like a Greek punishment where some naughty person flew too high. So he was strapped down and then a raven or some other hungry animal would come and eat his liver every day. And then his liver would grow back. <laughs> That's humanity. That's humanity. Predators come and eat your liver every day and your liver grows back. Time to heal. Time to heal. Time to seal. Time to get whole again. Time to do the alchemy. Or to put it very bluntly, intimacy competes with Facebook. You're either intimate or you're on Facebook. Twitter and Facebook, Facebook purvey and rely on loneliness. They need atomized, schizoid, separated, hermits, recluses, nerds, socially inapt, socially unable to, bo to bind and to bond and to be intimate. They need this kind of population. It's the only kind of population that becomes conditioned and addicted to social media usage in lieu of real contact and real relationships. We know 
that manufacturers of products introduce into their products two elements. We know that. First of all, they try to make the products indispensable. Mm. Here, we have iPhone 7. Why? iPhone 3 works perfectly. Mm -hmm. Because they have rendered the product indispensable to our lives mm. via s as a status symbol, via branding, via new functions, by I mean, so-called new functions and so on. Mm. So all manufacturers try to render their products indispensable mm. and built into the products obsolescence. Mm. These are the two, two mantras of manufacturing. Same goes with social media. Social media tries to render itself indispensable and would obliterate any threat to itself. The biggest threat by far is an intimate, mature, adult, healthy, engulfing um, relationship. So social media are anything but social. Th they need atomized lonely individuals. Okay. But the real threat mm. is that you will find someone through Facebook or something mm. that uh, with whom you will develop an intimate relationship. And listen, it's extremely simple. Mm. They need to eliminate her from your life. They need to monetize your eyeballs. They need your eyeballs. Anything that competes with them for your eyeballs is a bloody threat. And that's your family, your, your uh, girlfriend, mm. television, mm. other social networks, mm. anything, Google. Mm. It's a threat. So lo love is a threat to social media. Love is a threat. Relationship is a threat. Uh, intimacy is a threat. Uh, togetherness is a threat. A community is a threat. Friendship is a threat. Anything that takes you away from Facebook. So period. if social media is a virus, is a virus, is community, family, love, intimacy, is that the antidote to the virus? Yes, of course. Once in your life, experience true intimacy. Mm. Social media suddenly feel plastic. Yeah. Feels weird. Weird. Mm. Feels creepy, I would feels say. Feels creepy, even. yeah. With that as the underlying assumption for how things are, we live in a world, and this is what I wrote about really through most of the 90s, where it seems like uh, government, corporations, the market, communications, education, religious institutions are all specifically designed to thwart our pathways to coherence. They're all about, oh, people are looking up to get coherence. Let's put the cross right up there. Or people, you know, oh, now they're looking up at the clock tower to the church. Let's put the clock up there with, uh, you know, with how long they're going to have to work for the day. Or they're looking at the TV. Let's start flashing images so they can't settle on anything. Let's do lots of fast cuts. Let's take their music. Take their music. For God's sake, this is the part that really always gets me. Their music, which is how their bodies got coherence. Let's make MP3s out of it. Let's take it out of the speakers and put it in teeny little earbuds so they think they're listening to music, but they're not getting any of it at all. So that we're walking around in this world where it feels like almost every institution and every technology is, if not consciously, at least inadvertently, designed to to coerce us and control us by disconnecting us from these uh, very fundamental ways of, of perceiving and interacting with our universe, with our reality, by making that whatever your little antenna, just don't. Let's just put enough noise that your antenna can't find the signal, that you lose your coherence, that you think that now you are the source of your coherence rather than well, your resonance with something else. If, if the church can't control you, which is another way to get between you and, and that cosmic connection, right, to, to make it basically the church was the government for a long time, um, then I could do it by threatening your property, threatening your safety, anything that makes you focus local and very limited and very narrow. The narrower I make your focus, which we were talking about driving down, we're, we're TV generation guys, right? So as our technology developed, what happened? The screen got bigger and bigger, it was simulating the movies, right? Because we were so visually entranced by this television thing that we could not get a big enough image. We, we wanted it to be as panoramic as nature, right? So basically, if we'd sit in our backyards, we'd go, uh, we were happy. IMAX, bigger, bigger, right? And all of a sudden, the next generation came by, we went, no, no, we want to be faster. So all the images came down to the point now they're on a watch. You know, it's like, you know, so we, we have to narrow our focus, which basically makes us overconvergent, and it, getting a little technical here, it shuts off your pineal gland, your third eye, your intuition. You, you become like a cyclops. 
you can't well, make decisions become, because there's no, there's your, no contrast your, your anymore. Your brain, I mean, it becomes almost analogous to the traumatized. You know how they do for traumatized people? They do something called EMDR, where they yeah. move their eyes back and forth, and it helps sort because you know they get that 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 thousand mile well, stare. Is their their eyes sort of get locked in? It's a traumatized state, and you know if once you can really free your eyes left and right, you you come out of that. But if we're doing that with our devices and staring in, then we're 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 imitating a traumatized you're, state. You're, you're basically, it's like overdeveloping the biceps or the triceps. You're basically pulling the eyes in and you're not giving yourself any peripheral vision. And peripheral vision is what decides if you're safe or not. Because when you go into convergent, you're, you're basically in a predator state. I'm on defense. If I'm out here in a kind of open focus, yeah. right, I, I basically, I'm, I could be searching for food. I'm, I'm checking the terrain. I'm, I'm open. I'm, I'm not defensive and I'm up, right? And it's like people that are anxious, they get stuck on the Ferris wheel on the breath up. They're up, they're tight. And the ones that are depressed are stuck on the exhale and they're down, right? You see it all over the place. I see it all over the place anyway. And it, it gets to be the point where it's like they're drugging the, the reaction to, to, the, to the tension. Instead of understanding that the person became coordinated in their own body, they could correct it themselves. And, of course, then, then all hell breaks loose, right? Because people would start realizing that. Now, the only thing I was talking about is that the eyes are the key to this, so I'm just going to give you guys a little exercise to do because it, it, you're all, except for you under 25, you still have some room. Um, if you turn your head all the way to the right and turn your eyes all the way to the right and then keep your eyes all the way right, try and find a spot over there and turn your head back to the left, this invisible hand will appear to push your jaw and stop you from turning your freaking head because for years, every time something crossed your visual field, you turned your head and not your eyes. Your neck is running your eyes. Your neck can't see. I tell you this every single day of my life. <laughs> your neck can't see. But if your neck is the periscope turning your head, you're just, you're just a bunch of candy apples. Guess what? Your peripheral vision is going to collapse. Your central vision is going to become very limited. And that's why, you know, what is it? Like 80% of us become nearsighted. I, like your vision breaks down over time because you're overusing that, that one tool to control this little space in here which we've eliminated because now we don't actually meet with each other. We're just sitting there doing FaceTime. We well, feel good when we walk in nature because we're starting to, we, we rekindle some of the sensibility, some of this, what you would call uh, uh, almost a somatic relationship yeah, to the world. Anytime you go outside, I don't care. Because I mean, you don't have to understand no. what we're talking about to restore your coherence. Remember Soylent Green? The end of the movie? People. It's people. It's people. It's people. Yeah. They, they're eating the people. But they put the people in the thing and they show them yeah. what? Nature scenes, waterfalls, all kinds of like archetypal stuff right. to make them relax, make them feel safe. But the funny part, I always ask people, I have a big map of the world in the office and I, I'll just take a random tax. I said, I'll put it out in the middle of the ocean. I go, do you know what's going on in there? You think it's all peaceful and happy, all harmony? No. Fish, eating fish, eating fish, eating fish, eating fish, eating fish. It's violent as hell. But we're, we, oh, the ocean. So we have this very, um, the same thing with space. You know, oh, oh, space is all peaceful and celestial. No, no, you go out there, you freeze, you go watch what happened to Sandra Bullock. Ah! You know, it's like it's not good out there. So it's like the environment doesn't care, just like your neck can't see. We have to put our consciousness into it to give it meaning and then extract that meaning back to ourselves down here on planet Earth in the troposphere with all the other humans. We've, we've almost, in a way, kind of, kind of hallmarked nature to being, to being the peaceful place and society being the violent place, right? As if civilization was a big mistake. No, civilization was our way to adapt to that crap out there. Otherwise, it basically, you know, the, the elephants would have stomped us to death. So it's like, it's like, no, no, we had to have a way to do that. But now that we're here, now that we're here and we have awareness of this stuff now we got to go back and do the rest for everybody else and that's like i said that's why when you disassociate and you become uh in, in nlp they'll, they'll, they'll call it uh you, you become disassociated visually and you you're feeling shut off uh your system has to kind of like go through another trauma to come back and that's i deal with a lot of that with ems workers that, that they call it verbal first aid and the first thing you say to somebody who's coming out of one of those things is the worst is over because if you say that, like you're in an accident, the guy's sitting there, his legs over there, his arms are, don't worry, the ambulance is coming, the worst is over. They're literally, like their blood vessels will start healing right there because they know that they heard the command that the trauma is done. Most people, the trauma begins after the physical accident, after the, the, the death in the family, because there's nobody to get them out of that, that turmoil. Well, it's, it's our fault, I think. I think that, I mean, uh, very 
going very deep on this, uh, when a, when a nation becomes wealthier and more educated or more educated, its reliance on a super being and church attendance goes down. Our brain is big enough to ask very complicated questions, but not big enough to answer them. So into that void slips super beings. And when we start kicking those super beings out for better or worse, we need answers. And there's nothing that feels more godlike or Jesus-like or mystical than technology, because I still can't figure out how my phone is able to do what it does. Uh, if I have a very serious question, do I ask a priest, rabbi, mentor, scholar, or boss? No, I ask Google, and I trust Google's answer more than I trust uh, any priest or rabbi. So the new Jesus Christ of our generation are a man who denied his own blood under oath when he was worth a quarter of a billion dollars, better known as Steve Jobs, or a guy who believes he can be the CEO of two companies, Jack Dorsey. So I, it, we are so, there's, we suffer from an idolatry of innovators. And we have issued the mother of all hall passes for the CEOs of tech companies that we would never issue for CEOs of other industries. And the result is they're taking advantage of it and they're doing things that we just wouldn't have tolerated from other industries. I mean, my question is if Michael Milken committed crimes today, but he was the CEO of a tech company, not a junk bomb firm, would he have gone to jail for 10 years? Did Michael Milken do anything worse than what Mark Zuckerberg is doing right now? Hmm. Do you think it all started with Steve Jobs? I mean, he obviously was the, the, the number one, like the biggest one, the biggest names and the name and probably the most important. And he was known for being such an ass, as you point out, de denying his, his child and so on. The stories about him are legion about what a jerk he was at every turn. I think it's been a slow creep of technology slowly but surely has become such an ubiquitous part of our life. It, there's such wonder and awe around technology. And quite frankly, it's made so many people so much money that everybody has a friend whose, whose daughter went to Google and got rich. Everybody, it, people are just really excited about what Amazon can do in terms of delivering their Nespresso pods within 48 hours. Netflix is a wonder. And maybe you own Amazon stock in your 401k. So it's easy. And our, our elected officials, no one, the fastest way to look old is to start going after big tech. It's like putting on mom mm -hmm. jeans. It just ages you. And so a 73-year-old insurance Those are back in, by the way, mom jeans. They are back in. There, that makes you look younger. But I, I look, I just think we've treated these companies. There's a two class system in our legislative branch and across our economy. It's the way we treat tech companies and the way we treat everybody else. Again, if you know any one of these media companies could be reverse engineered with the kind of anti competitive behavior or weaponizing our elections, these guys get to play by a different set of rules, which leads to, I think, extraordinarily bad behavior. And, the, the reality is if you tell a 30 year old male he's Jesus Christ, he's inclined to believe you and he will play by his own rules. It's not their fault, it's ours. Anyone still on Facebook in any meaningful sense right now is a, is a mental patient. And I mean that. If you're on Facebook trying to make a point, you're nuts. It's, oh, it's a graveyard. I see people that I like kind of respect on fate and they go into these multi-paragraph things on facebook and they're, tr they're like well here's what i here's how i see it here's how i see it. could there be anything less appropriate than your take on facebook there's nothing to say anymore on that site it's like the people are still there are sick. You're convincing sick people. My mother is in a mental institution. They're all more well-adjusted than my Facebook timeline. Also on technology, one other comment I thought was, was really interesting came in from listener Oker Ogre, who points us to a story today, August 2nd, in The Guardian, and uh, I'm going to read the headline. This is from The Guardian, so I'm just the messenger here. I want to <laughs> – trigger warning. It's, uh, it uses a word that's a little gross, okay, but it's, it's a metaphor. Uh, and I think, I think this is okay to say on the show. The headline is NBC paid $7.75 billion for its Olympic rights, and we got televisual vomit. And that's a story by Aaron Timms in The Guardian today, and it includes this quote, NBC has deployed a vast arsenal of broadcast resources to spray America's households with a kind of inescapable Olympic televisual vomit. Viewers have been able to see everything at any given moment, provided you have the Peacock streaming service, 
while understanding fundamentally nothing about what's going on. And that's the quote. And once again, I think this is case in point about what's happening in larger society. It's not just about the Olympics. It's not just about the sports. Increasingly, we have these platforms, these systems, uh, that are often sponsored by giant corporations. They are delivered to us through big tech platforms. And what they deliver to us is uh, just everything. I mean, an overload of information and data and graphics and statistics and filtering and, and all sorts of affordances for us to swim through the data. And it, it barfs up everything at us and we understand fundamentally nothing about what's going on. Because if all we're given is, is a, an unmediated source of data, stream of data coming at us, a fire hose of data that's being provided to us by these platforms, it, that's not actually helpful. We need some human mediation. We need some human guidance to make sense, to, to allow us to have some, to, to lead us to some sort of understanding of the data. And coming back to this idea of sports, if we're building a system of, of sports, whether we're playing or we're, we're watching as fans, and, and we are handing the entire idea of sports over to big tech platforms and these giant fire hoses of data, well, then what happens to sports? <laughs> who, who's left to root for at that point? Uh, who was it uh, on the, on the, oh, it was, it was again, Web Hamster Henry wrote on the comment board, I'm waiting for the Boston Robotics baseball team, the Spots. <laughs> You know Boston Robotics. It's it's the company that makes those those uh, those menacing robotic dogs. The NYP NYPD bought one recently, or or leased one at uh, enormous expense recently, until the headlines got out uh, about how bad an idea that was, and so they reversed it and gave back the dog. But R Boston Robotics is always coming out with these oh happy fun videos showing the robots dancing to. To, uh, to, to fun contemporary pop hits. And, and the message is, see, there's, there's, they're fun. There's, there's nothing menacing or sinister about these dogs that, that uh, can run faster than humans and can be outfitted with uh, laser-guided uh, automated weapons. Nothing at all, nothing at all to see. Look at them dance, look at them dance. And soon enough, when we see them in the baseball stadium and uh, they're fielding their own baseball team, uh, are we supposed to root for them? I mean, again, case in point, are we supposed to root for the robots? And I would suggest that we are not. We are here to root for the humans. Let's look at what the tech companies are doing. Let's, let's play angel's advocate for a minute. Okay, they are really trying to deliver you something you will attend to. They really are trying to do that. And they are building unbelievably powerful AI machines to analyze even your bloody eye movements to see what you're looking at. They are also trying to figure out what you want and need and deliver it to you as fast as possible. Amazon, click, bang, at your doorstep. Yeah, okay, well, they know a lot about you, but it turns out you actually have to know a lot about someone in order to be able to do that. So can we trust them? Can we trust us? Well... Not if we're lying. Like, that's the, that's the critical issue here. It's not even ideology, exactly, although we could get into that. Mm -hmm. It's lying. That corrupts all of this. That turns a heuristic into a bias. That turns information into misinformation. And so these companies that are trying to serve us to the degree that there's deceit and, let's say, the naked desire for power and control is kind of a psychopathic edge to the degree that that's operative all these systems get contaminated and we definitely have to be on the lookout for that
That's what I wanted to talk about in the final part of my conversation with Mark Hurst. I have personally deleted my Facebook profile long since, right? We did a whole episode about that. I'm in the process of leaving Google. But I want to get at a bigger question here because we're enmeshed in the networks and the um, schemes of many of these tech giants. I guess I want to ask you about, am I opening myself up to charges of hypocrisy if I continue to use the services of some tech giants like Amazon or Netflix or Apple or Microsoft while working so hard to rid myself of my connections with Facebook and Google? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I would put myself right there with you, Wade. I mean, I still use big tech services. I carry an iPhone. My family's a subscriber to Netflix. You know, I'm speaking to you on a Zoom connection that is running on a MacBook Pro that was designed by Apple and manufactured probably completely in China. And l l let's just take that example for, for a moment. Um, this week on my uh, Tectonic episode, I interviewed an author named Amelia Pung, who wrote a book called Made in China, which talks about forced labor in China um, that takes place in detention centers and uh, basically slave labor factories, essentially. They're, they're called different things. And occasionally we see news that suppliers to the company, these big tech companies, are implicated in forced labor. And I recommend that people read the book um, Made in China by Amelia Pong if they want the details, and they're nightmarish. I'll just tell you, Wade, they're nightmarish. So reading that book and talking to Amelia and realizing that this computer I'm talking to you on, this MacBook Pro, was probably made in part through forced labor. Have I given away the computer? Have I sent it to the recycling facility? No, I'm still using it. And my conclusion is that we're all enmeshed, to use your word, or to use my word, we're all complicit in the sins of this global, big tech dominated economy. We're all complicit. So what do we want to do about it when you really look at it? And I think it's really important for us to take the time to become aware about how we're complicit, look at the details, understand the forced labor, understand the economics and the business, uh, the business models that, that Google and Apple and others are reliant on. And when we gain that awareness, we may find it's impossible to extricate ourselves from the system totally. But <laughs> here's the good news. With the awareness, we can make some local choices to improve things. And who knows where that'll lead, Wade, if enough of us make the decision to extricate ourselves from Google to the point of this episode, maybe if enough of us do that, we'll form a movement and other companies will see an opportunity to build less exploitative tools for us. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll start to build some momentum. You got to start somewhere. This is to my point earlier that setting a goal of getting ourselves 100% off of Google is, is unrealistic. And it's, and I think it's a little bit of a harmful goal because it's so hard that people are going to give up early on. But instead, let's, let's have a goal of learning what's happening in the world and then making some choices for ourselves, some small choices at first, how we want to do things differently, and to have some humility about it. Do you feel like this strategy of individual level boycott or renunciation can add up to something meaningful down the road? How does it, how does it change things when an individual decides to stop using Google stop buying Apple products, stop being on Facebook, whatever it might be? Yeah, great question. Here, here, let me add to that list of questions. Why recycle? Why vote, Wade? Are you kidding? When is the last time an election was, was determined by one vote? Why be polite to people on the subway here in New York City? Why do anything individually, Wade, that is against our immediate interest of comfort and and pleasure and convenience. Why do anything for anybody else? <laughs> I mean, I've heard this over the years. Um, 
Mark, why do you tell people to get off of Facebook? Do you think Mark Zuckerberg cares that one more listener of yours deleted their Facebook account? Do you understand how many billions, you know, I've heard all of it, Wade. Um, and I just want to say, do you vote? <laughs> do you do anything that's, that's helpful for, for someone else? Why? Um, what does it matter in the grand scheme? Not to get too deep in, the, in this conversation about Google, Wade, but, but these questions around what we should be doing with technology, they quickly lead to questions of, of ultimate values and meaning. Why are we here, Wade? Why are we on this earth? What are we supposed to do with our lives? What, what do our lives mean? Is it only meaningful if we have a billion dollars of net worth as, as counted by the, the, uh, the NASDAQ gods? Is there any other meaning in this life? Personally, I think that there is meaning in self-sacrifice and doing something that's helpful to someone other than yourself. And if, if by making some of these changes in my own habits with technology, I'm starving Google just a little bit of a few bits of personal data, then maybe I have added my vote to tear down that company. And that's all I can do. I, I can't save the world, I'm just, I'm just one person, but it's, it's really a question of what do you believe in and what are your values by which you wanna live your life? In the final section of the book, you have an extended interview with Ralph Martin. So you return to the welcome table because Ralph is the doorkeeper there. And he gave one of the wisest testimonies, I guess, about life in the city, what it is and what it could be. And I just want to read two quotes about the problem and the possible solution in New York. Ralph says, and speaking about the changes, Craig, that you and I are talking about as big tech comes into the city and everybody walks around with, with uh, phones and, and AirPods and everything, always plugged into the big tech services rather than to the fabric of the city. Here's what Ralph Martin says. I worry that the social fabric of the city has eroded as it has changed from an organic social entity into some strange virtual reality theme park. You can actually watch the people not seeing what's going on around them. They're in their own world. And th those are the people that Jeremiah Moss in his book calls phone zombies. And then the very next page, Ralph finishes with this thought, which I thought was a great benediction of the entire book. Ralph says, The only thing I respect in the world is compassion. The only thing that's of any interest to me in the world is love. It's the only thing that's interesting. The greatest, the most precious thing in the world is company, the company of those you love. So all you need to do is love everybody, and then you can always have it. <laughs> I mean, I get choked up just reading that. I needed Ralph to voice some of these things, and thankfully he was able to. And I, I, yeah, I hope that people who read the book might have their own Ralphs in their life. They might know people like this in New York, um, guides, spiritual guides, intellectual guides, just sort of moral guides, people who can live well in a city, which is a an increasingly tough thing to do, but it's a very important thing to do. The proximity to others, the proximity to the other people who aren't like us. You know, someone like Ralph was just there to lead by example, to reach across the chasm and reach out to his fellow New Yorkers. And that to me is the kind of New Yorker who should be celebrated. You know, that's the kind of New Yorker who's, who's there making the city work every single day. Have you ever called someone up and you're disappointed when they answer the phone? <laughs> you wanted the machine, you know, and you're always kind of thrown off. You go, oh, I, uh, I, I didn't know you were there. I uh, just wanted to leave a message saying, sorry, I missed you. So here what we have is two people hate each other, don't really ever want to talk, but the phone machine is like this relationship respirator keeping these marginal brain-dead relationships alive. And we all do it. Why? So that when we come home, you can see that little flashing red light. You go, all right, messages. You see, 
People need that. It's very important for human beings to feel that they are popular and well-liked amongst a large group of people that we don't care for. I have one more thing. I want to be clear. In the morning, you should not turn over and look at your phone. Because the phone, all you're going to get in that little guy is misery. There's a nice warm body next to you, or more than likely, considering the demographics, there's nothing. And if there is nothing, don't look at the phone. At least get up and go to the bathroom and look at yourself in the mirror there, because that is, you know, barring a few things, one of the more unvarnished representations of yourself that you can get instead of this awful misery-making thing that makes you sick. And we're back. Next two weeks, friends, you know what to do. Avoid Amazon and Apple. Forget Facebook. And whatever you do, get off Google. And when you are riding the subway in New York City, put the phone down. And pick up a book or just look at your fellow New Yorkers. Let's have a few more acts of resistance on public transportation, okay? Proximity to people who are different from us, as Craig Taylor said. And for our outro this evening, the, <laughs> the first few seconds of which I think you just heard, I'm doing something different. And it's, uh, it's a, a song by... 